cryotoid channel blood fluid. Yes, we're back with Far Beyond the World. And you remember we left it on something of a cliffhanger last time. But before we get right into it, just may, may say a quick thank you to all my patrons. You're much appreciated. And in particular, I have to go and mention my top patrons. Grizz, Evan King, David Taylor, Samuto, Brian Hall, Anubis Silverwind, Isla Corval, Brandon Bradford, Bastian, Lark Huskerton, Marcus, Kopi, Gunamulla, Tiger Cub, Sindri Dragowolf, Dissonance, Basuksu, Cobus Visser, and Kartek. So it's been a while since we've been hanging out with Ranok. So I think it's uh, time to go back and find out what's been happening. He closes the door behind him and gives me a tentative smile. His glossy eyes are matching mine. Before either of us breaks down in tears, he's already on me. I can feel his longing, evident in a tight embrace. He's holding me as if afraid that should he let go, I'd disappear in a puff of smoke. Not that I mind. This is what I wanted all those days, to be held firm and secure in his arms. No one makes me feel as safe as he does. Well, I'm so glad to see you're fine. I worried every day. What about me? You're the one out there. Well, out there I'm in my element, but you, here. Yeah. He cuts off, not wanting to vocalise any of his fears. I can sense through his tightening grip he's been tormented by some strained thoughts. I'm fine. I mutter, trying to reassure him, while he takes idle sniffs of my skin and hair. Your scent has changed. He says in a slightly worried tone. Oh, um, it's just a soap Varissa gave me. I try to laugh it off, he presses me deeper into his chest, allowing me in turn to finally take in his smell. And I'm back at the meadow again, among the whispering woods surrounded by the scent of the forest. I could stay like this forever. You smell fine to me before, but if you prefer this... I don't mind either way. I try not to blush at the veiled compliment. It doesn't make sense as a wolf he'd rather have me smell of myself than flowers. I could ask her for an unscented one if it bothers you. I propose quietly. I saw him go back to scrubbing myself with ash. Oh, whatever works for you, oh, I'm just glad you're alright. He whispers, his hold still in full force, I begin to worry that it's not really about my scent. Something feels wrong. Are you all right? That's the question. Finally, the wolf chuckles and pulls away, trying to rub away his tears discreetly, masked by the awkward scratching of his muzzle. What's this, then? He deflects, looking at the skillet and dons a wide smile. A little welcome home gift. I know we're going to the feast, but I wanted to make something special just for you. How did you... I asked for Rister about your favourite meal. She gave me instructions, but I've made it all by myself. I stayed with a twinge of pride. The wolf stands there, looking at me with complete disbelief, his lips twitching slightly until he musters a wavering smile. You truly are a moon send. He sighs, his watery eyes trembling in the light of the dancing flames. He hugs me once again, all the gratitude I could ever wish for conveyed in his warm embrace. I slink into his form and savour the moment while he tries to compose himself, his muzzle hidden from my view. But once he lets go, he's back to his old stoic self. He takes off his sword and pauldron, draping the green cape over one of the chairs. I want to help him with his gear, but he refuses, so I take this opportunity to set up the table and serve him the food. The wolf takes his seat, immediately throwing a confused gaze at me as I heap everything onto his plate. No, you're not going to eat. No, this is all just for you. 
I shake my head with a gentle smile. Well, we can't have that. He mutters in feigned displeasure, cutting energetically into the pork. I was never any good eating while Triss just watched. Rana impales onto a fork a succulent piece, along with an apple slice, and nods towards me. Come, have a taste of your hard work. I sigh in amusement and approach, reaching out towards his open paw, only to be pulled into his lap while he laughs merrily. Whoop! <laughs> I blush, feeling as my form sinks into his warm and slightly sweaty body. It's clear he's rushing to get home as fast as he could. Each of his bulging muscles sends a shiver down my spine, and he knows it. But the complete KO comes when he brings the loaded fork towards my lips. I part them shyly and accept the food, here as his tail thumps intensify. Being fed like that, in his arms... My heart speeds up and I don't want this moment to end. Mmm, good, right? He murmurs that you slowly. The meal is indeed delicious, but I can't focus on it as I feel something expand beneath my buttocks. Yes. Should I set a portion aside, then? The wolf smirks totally. I don't know how much more of it I can take. Uh, no! I jump off to Rannoch's surprise, almost as if burned. But Roy takes it the wrong way, simply give him a taunting smile and ruffle his fur. As I said, those are all for you. I'll have my fill at the feast. Well, very well, then. He chuckles and slaps my butt playfully. Skedaddle. Oh! I yelp, instinctively running back to my seat like a flustered waiter as much to his delight. When I'm seated again, I glance at the barrel with an awkward expression. I would have served us mail, but I don't know how to open the damn thing. <laughs> the wolf speaks between the bites, getting up to his feet. I watch as he approaches the cupboard and retrieves the wooden hammer and the wedge, swallowing with a satisfied sigh. Well, I see there's at least a gallon of moonshine here as well. You're setting into our little charade. It was the least I could do. Oh, it's more than I'd ever ask of you. He replies, walking out of the barrel and placing the wedge at the rim of the lid. Good thing you don't have to ask, then. With one swift stroke of the hammer, he frees the cap which rotates on its axis, splashing some ale around and causing us both to laugh. Damn. I'm still easily amazed by this rustic way of life. I want to rush in and grab the tankards from the shelf, but Rannoch takes hold of my waist and hoists me up like a rag doll. What the? The room whirls and he plops me down in a chair. You've done enough, pup. At least let me serve a drink. He snickers and I roll my eyes in amusement, resting my elbow on the table to prop my chin up. I watch as his tail wags happier and happier with each tankard filled. He brings them over and I grab my share, taking a quick sip followed by a rather thirsty gulp. Mmm... I'm not going to lie, I miss this. The uh, brew starts to grow on you? That, and the meals together in general. The wolf's tail swishes again as he sits himself comfortably with a dreamy twinkle in his eyes. I can't believe you went through all this trouble. There's no trouble at all. In fact, I had more trouble staying alive without you. Rannoch laughs and again looks at me the longing of a thousand years. Right, I can believe. He finally shifts his focus to the meal, I'm glad for it, as his penetrating stare does something to me on an elemental level. I feel butterflies, my heart tremors each time our gazes meet. I bet he can sense that, but thankfully he doesn't dwell on it and takes another big bite. Mmm, it's delicious. Yeah, i better mess something up. I mumble awkwardly, taking an idle sip while he shakes his head. Well, it's perfect. And even if you do it, it'll still be the best meal I had in ages. Oh, and why is that? I ask cheekily, to which he only responds with that disarming smirk. Because you've made it. Again, those shining emeralds pierce right through me, and becoming increasingly flushed. He knows it too. His tail's happy tapping betrays it, and he continues to drill his gaze into me, raising slightly one of his brows. 
as much as I enjoy his advances, we still had a chance to talk about, well, us. So I get slightly anxious. I rub my arms and wittingly draw his attention to them. His loving gaze suddenly shifts when he notices the bruises, and just like that all the humour is sucked out of him. Could have all do that. I'm not sure if it's just a blind guess or if he's suspecting something, but I decide to cut this in its crib with a nervous chuckle. Before you jump to any conclusions, those are from a friendly spa, nothing else. A spa? He sounds unconvinced, I wave my hand at him teasingly. No, you sound like Marissa. It was a spa. I wanted Walter to show me a few things, just for fun. And he did? Again, doubt is clearly visible on his muzzle. Why wouldn't he? Because Wall's idea is fun, of fun is gutting a bore or knocking someone's teeth out. I really can't see him sparring with you for fun. Oh, we did the ball cutting all right. Don't worry about that. Thankfully, no one's teeth needed to be knocked out. I laugh, masking my anxiety around another sip. It seems I threw him off. So, you worked at the butchery? Mm hmm. And you're okay? Of course, it's quite fun. He showed me how sausages are made. Huh, who'd have thought? Oh, I guess I worried over nothing. A subtle smile reappears on his muzzle, and I sigh internally in relief. Honestly, Rannock, he's really good to me. I wouldn't wish for a different guardian. Is that so? He raises his brow in a teasing fashion, and I chuckle, realising how it came across. Was I not meeting your standards, my lord? Oh, shut it, you hypocrite. I scoff playfully, rolling my eyes and his smile widens. I'm a hypocrite now? Well, what a fine welcome this turns out to be. As at the villa, I saw where you grew up, you princely in disguise. Take your lardy dars and shut them up your tail. I stick my tongue out, although at first he laughs, his expression slowly turns. You're at the villa? Yeah. Damn, it's a bit too casual a way to mention it. I'll be worrying about another thing. And? And I'm still alive, aren't I? I try to bring back some sense of levity, but it doesn't work. Well, what were you doing there? I was summoned to help with the luncheon for the elders. I respond truthfully. At this point, there's no sense beating around the bush. You met Aldris. Although I find it funny he singled her out, it's clear he's not sharing my amusement. His tone betrays deep concern. Again, I try to brush it off. I met her and her pipe-smoking shadow. Did they mistreat you? Those two have a reputation, that's for sure. I really don't want to waste our time on them. They didn't do anything that would be out of their character. They're just two massive cunts. He snorts, surprised by my boldness. Well, that they are. They're also dangerous. I learned that the hard way, but it's nothing I can't handle. I wink, cocking my finger and finally managing to draw a reluctant smile from him. When you said your father and the elders didn't get along, you weren't fucking kidding. I know, right? Talk about an understatement of the century. Rannoch laughs merrily and eases up, simply digging back into his meal. He must have been starving, or in an unlikely event I managed to cook it properly, he simply enjoys the meal because he devours it in quick chomps. I allow him to focus on the food for a bit, especially since his tail taps the chair again in a lively rhythm. Seeing he finally lightened up, I decide to switch the topic to something more casual. Did you get this furniture from the villa when you moved out? What? Raw? He protests in an oddly stern fashion, swallowing heavily a mouthful. Looks pretty similar. I made all of this myself. Wait, you did? I blink in astonishment, casting my gaze around the rooms. Well, yeah, well, why so surprised? I crafted all the furniture with my very own paws. Rannoch mutters, taking a long sip to wash the food down. I'm sure father helped me out a bit, and I used the villa furniture as models, but this here is all new. He shrugs, patting the tabletop with pride. 
damn, is there anything he cannot do? And just to read in my mind, the wolf continues. The only things I had to buy were the things I couldn't make myself. Like the candelabra, hinges, nails, and other metal items. I'm not a smith, you know. Apparently there are. Still a far cry from my own ineptitude. But everything I bought was paid for with my hard work. Okay, okay, I believe you. I laugh, raising my hand, hands in surrender. You really do make a show of how self-made you are. Well, I have to. He shrugs again, cut into one of the last remaining pieces of meat. Well, I don't want other wolves to think I'm a spoiled brat resting on his father's laurels. Literally. I tease, mimicking the chief's wreath with my hands. But trust me, you're far from it. Everyone can see how independent you are. He smiles, hungrily swallowing the last bit of pork and lifting the plate up. To my surprise, he starts licking it in long, slow laps of his tongue, releasing satisfied groans in between. I blush, both the compliment of a plate lit clean, but also the sight of his tongue in action and his... rather provocative moans. This time around, I'm the one getting aroused at the table. I try to look away, allowing him to finish in peace. Once he sternly puts the plate down and gives me a tender smile. Oh, thank you. This was unexpected. And much needed. Ranagard softly, placing his paw on top of my hand, and I interlay it with my other one. You're welcome. He blushes slightly at that gesture and he treats his paw, clearing his throat nervously. He grabs his tankard as an excuse and nods toward me. I take hold of my mug and we clank them merrily, taking a deep gulp. The wolf reclines and looks towards the darkening sky outside. Despite being in obviously good mood, he frowns again. Oh, I'm sorry you had to endure all this and drown on your own. I wish I were there to protect you. I think it's a good thing I was on my own. You and me in one room with those abusive assholes? We'd be discovered in the blink of an eye. I snarled and he smirks, looking at me coyly. Yeah, I guess. You have changed quite a bit over the course of a week. You're more confident. I like it. He nods with satisfaction and takes a sip of ale. I guess this new reality is finally sinking in. Plus I had to rely on myself a little bit more. Well, I specifically asked Wolf to take care of you. The wolf mutters, betraying a hint of disappointment which I won't allow to linger. And he did. It also made me more self-reliant without any coddling. Coddling? He nearly spits his bruise he chokes on my remark. Now you definitely sound like Vol. He's not wrong, though. I appreciate everything you do for me, I really do. I appreciate the cuddles, and even an occasional coddle. I chuckle, causing his muzzle to brighten. It does feel good to be able to stand on my own every once in a while. At first his green eyes lock on me with surprise, then a spark of pride glimmers inside of them as he gives me an approving smile. Huh, I left a small, trembling boy and returned to find a confident young man. Seems the time apart did us both some good. I'll drink to that. I feign a toast we cling the tankards once again. Speaking of time apart... I mutter reluctantly as he takes his sip. Did... did you arrive at any conclusion? Regarding... us? My skin gets hotter and hotter as I realise how awkward it sounds. Oh, I did. The grey wolf states plainly. Well, I think that the conversation requires a time and place, neither of which are suitable right now. Oh? He's going to deflect again, isn't he? We have a feast to attend to, and... He pauses, his somewhat unsettled gaze darting into the distance. There will be a few urgent matters to discuss. But once all of that is done, we'll have a long, honest conversation which you deserve. You promise? I don't try to hide a twinge of doubt within my voice. I swear it on my moonstone. He tugs at the glimmering pendant, emptying his mug in one go and standing up. Come, time to go. 
The sooner we deal with this, the sooner we can have that one-to-one. -one. I nod, smiling, and get up to my feet. As I empty my own tankard, Rannoch's gaze darts my waistline for a moment, and all looks back to me with a quite confused expression. Where is that Cora's purse? Oh, yeah. I met her awkwardly, patting the pouch. She regifted it to me. I hope you don't mind. No, I just... I didn't know she didn't like it. The wolf's voice wavers a little, and his ears slump slightly. It's clear he's a bit saddened by this. I'm sure she loved it. I try to comfort him. She just didn't have a use for it. As it happens, I nearly lost one of Wolf's tokens, so it was a solution to my lack of pockets. I really needed something to carry things in. I laugh awkwardly, and it seems I managed to distract him. Where he quickly shakes his head in bewilderment. Wait, one of Wolf's... what? Here, I'll show you. I take out the Black Wolf's coin from the purse and walk towards the cupboard to retrieve the other one. I actually got one of yours, too. I pass both tokens to him, and Ronak expects them in disbelief. How did you? It's been a long week. Oh, apparently so. He exhales in amazement, causing me to smile with pride. I want you to have them. What? Oh, no. The wolf protests, shaking his head. I could not accept them. Why not? Well, if you've earned them, then they're yours, both of them. He states plainly, and I just scoff in amusement. True, but I can give them to you. Well, and I can refuse to accept, can't I? The wolf smokes playfully. I'm getting slightly confused. He notices Darren's size, placing the paw on my shoulder and looking deep into my eyes with a proud smile on his muzzle. Well, I appreciate the gesture. I do. You have no idea how happy it makes me to see you flourish like this. You almost sound surprised. I tease and he nods in equal jest. Oh, in a good sense, but I am. It's good to see you stand on your own feet. That's why I don't want to take away the fruits of your labour. Hold on to them. They may yet come in handy. I guess I can see his point of view, so I smile at him with gratitude and deposit the coins into my new purse. As I close it, I run my finger on the Celtic knot motif and look at the wolf. The filler, I saw the same pattern on the banners inside the main hall. Is that your people's crest? Oh, yes. Well, why do you ask? The wolf responds, fastening his paw run and cloak. It just caught my attention, is all. Is there any significance behind it? Oh, it's a symbol of Tiernan. It represents the infinite crossroads. He states if it's obvious, and I raise my brows at him for an elaboration. What do you mean? It's a mythical meeting place where countless paths intersect and worlds come together. Huh. I muse, nod comforting smiles stretching involuntarily across my face. What? Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Where else would our paths have crossed if not here? At first he blinks, then the wolf smiles back at me. One of the reasons why I knew we were meant to meet. Oh, I see the dandelion served you well. He nods towards my pins, he finally secures his massive sword. More than you can possibly imagine. It's all better days though. Oh, I guess it's time to part with it. Rannoch now nods towards the fire and I frown at the suggestion. Well, not good for you to go out there with a wilted weed on your shoulder. True. I concede reluctantly, and I remove it from its rightful place. Despite the flower being quite dishevelled, I regard it with deep sentiment and the wolf notices it. Oh, don't worry. From now on I'll get you a new one every day for as long as they'll be in bloom. Let's not resort to dandelion genocide. I chuckle, appreciating his gesture. Well, every few days should suffice. As my lord wishes. He bows teasingly and I smile. I toss the flower into the hearth, watch as instantly evaporates in the fire. Come. 
His paw invites me towards the door while he douses the flames with water. We step outside into the pleasantly tepid evening. I jump merrily over the uneven step as the wolf closes the door behind us. Oh, I see you've caught on. He smiles with satisfaction at my antics. Did you trip over it? Not since the first time we went out. I reply with pride. I've seen Triss stumble, though. It was pretty amusing. Oh, I was thinking about replacing that lower step. He admits as he's carefully bypassing it. No, leave it. I shake my head merrily. It gives you house character. You just enjoy watching people trip on it, don't you? Maybe. I shrug teasingly while the wolf takes a knee near one of the bushes. When he gets back up, I'm presented with a freshly picked dandelion. Here you go, Moondrop. He winks, and I can hardly contain a blush as I struggle to place it securely in my pin. We walk towards the town at a leisurely pace, simply enjoying each other's company. See, now the village is pretty much empty. I take this opportunity to strike another conversation. So, Cora. I whisper in a taunting fashion. He straightens up in surprise at my choice of topic. Oh, what about her? She seems nice. I wink and he immediately blushes. Okay, whatever you heard, it's not like that. Relax, I'm just teasing. I laugh, interrupting him for he can start some awkward explanation. I figured it out. You, you did? Wait, what exactly is it that you figured it out? The wolf sounds quite apprehensive and I chuckle seeing his ears lower in deference. Only the two of you play pretend to get some peace of mind. Or did I get it all wrong? I let the question hang playfully, and he blinks in astonishment. Huh, you actually did. Are you saying you thought I'd be dumber? No. He protests, almost as if he thought he really offended me. Uh, I'm just impressed. Again, just teasing. I laugh, shaking my head. It's uncharacteristically easy to ruffle his feathers tonight. Then again, I suppose he just doesn't want me to get the wrong idea. It must be hard being the most eligible bachelor and her being the most desirable maiden. Well, it's more complicated than that. He mutters uncomfortably, looking off to the side. True, it does keep others at bay. It mostly keeps our fathers from pushing us into each other's arms. They got quite heavy poured with it once Cora flowered. Oh. Well, it's awkward enough when everyone wants to bed you, when your own father tries to push you into bed with another. Yeah, that is kind of fucked up. I admit uneasily, can't even imagine how miserable I'd feel in his proverbial shoes. Once we started pretending we're a thing, they eased up a bit, most likely thinking they've accomplished the goal. Rannock scoffs in annoyance and I lean in, trying to catch a glimpse of his saddened eyes. So, you don't like her? Well, I love her, but more like a sister. He exhales to a soft smile. When it comes to anything beyond that, I couldn't. Well, I mean, I could, I definitely could. The wolf chuckles nervously, obviously hinting at her good looks. But I don't want to. He notices my intense gaze and gets redder and redder with each word. It's clear he's uncomfortable with the idea of them getting intimate. Cora is a dear friend, that's all. I want her to be happy, and that happiness does not lie with me. What makes you so sure? His green eyes centre on me, and the wolf gives me a kind, encouraging smile, almost if he thought I was getting defensive. Perhaps I was, I'm not so sure myself. We knew each other since we were pups. If Cora and I were to fall in love, we'd have done so already. You said that the feelings don't matter when it comes to sex. To the tribe, they don't. But Cora is not my intended, and thus I won't be messing needlessly with her feelings. It's the last thing she needs. He mutters confidently, drawing a reluctant smile from me. You're always so mindful of those around you. Oh, I guess. Rannock shrugs. I definitely am with Cora. 
I feel sorry for her more than anything. Why? Because of her father. She really doesn't have that much going on for her. What? I blew it out through a chuckle. She's one of the most stunning she wolves I've ever seen. No arguments there. He scoffs in amusement. Well, it looks on everything, not in the tribe. The wolf shakes his head with a worried expression. Werther is just an advisor. His position isn't something he can pass on. True, but he has the bakery and lots of money, from what I've gathered. Yes, and all that goes to Dre. He is Werther's primary heir. My confidence wavers and I frown. Wait, so Kor is left with nothing? Pretty much. The wolf shrugs again. She has to make a name for herself and secure a match or provide a future for her. How is that fair? Well, our tribe is rarely concerned with fairness. The first pup gets everything. The rest are just spares in the eyes of our fathers. That's horrible. Well, I know. He agrees to a shallow nod. That's why I don't intend to sow my seed left, right and centre. Well, I'm no vither. If I'll have a pup, I want it to have a future. I've been doing everything I can to help Cora or entice other males. Dating a future chief? Makes one quite desirable. I finish for him. Yeah, exactly. I love that he's such a kind wolf. I bumped merrily into his shoulder, trying to cheer him up as the conversation took a rather heavy dip. Well, it's not like I'm not getting anything in return. She's pretty good at keeping other females at bay. Before we started this charade, it was getting quite frustrating at the feasts. Different females draping themselves over me. Oh, the horror! I tease, mimicking the expression from the screen by Munch. His lips flicker slightly, their edges curving up in a subtle smile. I mean, I do like females. I'm not into harlots. I'm a hunter. He states with pride, giving me one of his challenging looks. I like prey that's hard to get. Oh, yes. I muse playfully. I put up quite a fight swooning over you, didn't I? I don't give him my quest to cheer him up and finally let out a chuckle. Oh, swooning and being desperate are two different things. Besides, I like your swooning. The wolf murmurs, leaning into my ear and taking a surprise nibble at the lobe, sending the shiver shooting down my entire body. There, you did it again. Swoon for me, Moondrop. My heart speeds up, and I stop in my tracks while the wolf continues on, paying me no mind. As I stand there struggling to contain my embarrassment, I see his tail taking wide satellite swings from side to side. I smile, touch my ear where his fangs nipped at it, and take a moment to say for the first time he actually made a conscious move. It felt nice and sensual. I can't believe I'm getting worked up by it. I take a deep breath to cleanse myself of all his pent-up energy and rush to catch up. Match is now brisker pace. Once we arrive at the clear, I immediately focus on the bonfire. The scent of burnt wood accompanied by soothing crackling became such a permanent fixture of my life here. I stare with joy as the flames twist and flicker, constantly shifting form. This place always invokes such a homely feeling inside of me. Despite the grounds being quite lively, I can see the central table remains mostly empty. There's only Vol Tana what appears at first glance to be a bulky male almost as big as Vol himself. When the male walks up to chat with the black wolf, to my surprise he turns out to be a she, and she's pretty well in doubt. Once we arrive at the table, we're immediately intercepted by her. I assume that's Regara. To say she's imposing will be an understatement. I'm sorry, who is this and why do I have a sudden urge to squeeze him into my bosom? Not gonna lie, it looks like quite a comfy proposition. Oh my kidding, I know who that fucker is, you wouldn't shut up about him. The she-wolf laughs and then looks at me with amusement. Let me see. Hmm. She grabs my face in that now familiar farmer inspecting his livestock fashion. He's quite cute, in a feeble, fragile sort of way. 
The female snickers. Her attention immediately drifts towards my collar. She pokes at it with her claw. Ah, oh, but what's this? What a shameful display. Shawnee craftsmanship. Oh, my father's eyes are not what they used to be. Were you really in such a hurry you couldn't wait for my return? She looks to Ranok and the male shrugs awkwardly at the question. Oh, I mean, it's good enough. Good enough? Regara scoffs. This is your emblem we're talking about, not fucking hinges. I'll get a new one made straight away. Ranok's clearly trouble with that suggestion. His worried gaze ventures to me. I bring my hand discreetly towards the collar in a protective manner, make him aware that I don't want a thing changed. Oh, no need, really. He insists on my behalf. This one's perfectly fine. Are you sure? She seems a bit confused, giving me in the collar another look. Well, damn shame, we don't have to work on something intricate like that. Well, I guess you're right. I mean, he's just a ward, after all. The female erupts in a burst of bombastic laughter, quite similar to Vithers. Anyway, what was the battle of Heart and Alpha do to get some lubrication around here? She casts her eyes over the table, goes in full together with a clay bottle in one paw and a spare cup in the other. He pops the cork with his teeth, pouring clear moonshine right into the goblet and passing it to her. Ah, she is handsome. Regara clings the cup against the neck of the bottle. I need something stronger than that weak piss. She downs the contents in one go and sticks the goblet right back under Vol's nose. Oh, now that got some fire back into my veins. Give us another one, you beautiful beast, you. She laughs as the black wolf refills her cup with a bemused expression. When she empties it again, she walks to the table and clangs the goblet against it. Move, snowball! The female nudges Tano, effectively pushing the smaller wolf out of the way. This is my seat. He protests in annoyance, but she only snorts at him. Not tonight, it isn't. I have important stuff to discuss with the chief, so move or I'll eject you myself. Clearly seething with anger, he's imminent to cause a fight. But to my surprise, Tano closes his eyes, sighs, and scooches over to the side, having to seat herself comfortably. Here, here, come here. I blink as the world swishes in a forward direction I'm effectively pulled into her lap. She's holding on to me like one would hold a lapdog. A cute little fucker, isn't he? I can't stand so hell-bent on him. The female calls to Ranok. He blushes awkwardly as he takes his seat. Mom wants to swoosh his baby as well. Yes, she does. He's a bit scrawny, though. You need to feed it better. A lunar forbid you touch it too heavily, lest it falls apart. Don't worry, sturdy, and he leads on. Will pipes up between sips of the Everclear, drawing to his dismay her now more flirty attention. Yeah, look, I missed your grumpy muzzle. She sends him a wink, making the male increasingly uncomfortable. I don't think I've ever seen him flustered like this. He's almost blushing. Why don't you try a place with a tiny scrub? There's plenty of room. Regara pats a laugh where I'm currently resided. I knew it'd explode with laughter. <laughs> I'd pay to see that. We'll all have a drink together. I... <clears throat> he stutters and clears his throat nervously. Well, I'm fine. Piglet can be your drinking companion. Uh, Piglet, eh? She looks at me with a tussy grin, pinching on my cheek. Yeah, that's a fitting name for a ward if I ever heard one. But I doubt he could hold the pace. I'm just a little tick like him drink. You'll be surprised. Rick's not quite a lot given the chance. The female gives me a curious glance and smiles. Well, I'll gladly witness that. Before the banter can continue, I notice the chief and Vither approaching from behind one of the screens. I guess they took another walk to smoke their leaf. Wonder if it's some form of weed or just regular tobacco. Well, finally, we're waiting for you to grace us with your presence. The old male grumbles, looking at Rannock with displeasure. Well, I ought to go home and check on Sam. Oh, Sam. 
The chief blinks only to quickly center on me. Ah, the human. He's been doing fine. Uh, surprisingly, very little trouble. Well, speak for yourself. With her grumbles in clear displeasure, give me a less kind look. I guess he didn't take Cora's misadventure well. Well, I think off your lap. You're making a spectacle of yourself. The chief waves his paw at me dismissively. Regara found, frowns at the comment and gives me a confused look. Instead of saying anything, she simply shrugs and helps me off, allowing me to take a seat in the narrow gap between her and Vol. I guess this is yet another time I won't be sitting beside Ranok and his expression sours. I'm about to get up and sit by his side, but that's when the chief's voice echoes loudly. Was everyone settled? I uh, seems so. Fuck. The male looks around the table, causing me to abandon my plan to switch places and I do the same. Marissa is still missing, and Cora is nowhere to be seen. But besides that, the table seems to have the same setup as before. Come to think of it, I can't see Trist either. Oh, good. I don't think Marissa will be joining us any time soon. Those two didn't look too good. Well, if Fred and Nea are strong, and they're in good pause now. Oh, you don't even know the half of it. I hear Tano's taunting words and my stomach churns. Marissa's well, skills of the healer grew incredibly over the past two weeks. Why, this year he went at the cuffs of death when they brought him in. And look at him now. Why do you give this damn nonsense a rest already? The chief bangs his fist against the table, causing me to jump. So we don't have more important things to worry about. Why should he give the rest? He makes a valid point. The human is still a primary concern. And with Audrey's contemptuous tone joining the fray, all my innards are tied in knots. I thought he decided not to attend the feast while he's here. I decided to make an exception. Of course she fucking had. Did I miss something? Why is the human a hot potato? The large female asks in a hushed tone, causing Vol to lean in. I was ignoring I'll have another fight over him. This girl will ravel us with inflated battle stories while we have an intruder in our midst. <laughs> Regara chokes on a drink and clangs the cup angrily against the table, turning to face Aldris with a rather annoyed look. I'm sorry for my patrol being ambushed by raiders and the tension hog. Well, I'll gladly listen to the imminent threat this little tweet poses. She points at me, causing the pudgy female to scoff. You're failing to your own little girl. Rannock's transgressions are far more pressing than... Failings? Regara stands up, towering over the gathered, and Aldrich shifts slightly. I would invite you to repeat that, so we could have a different conversation, followed by a funeral. Are you threatening an elder of the feasting ground? I'm reminding a member of our tribe, if they question honour and position of another wolf, the insul insulted party can demand satisfaction, as is our custom. Perhaps you should just touch your boycott, and leave this clearly an interesting matter to us. The chief quips mockingly, only aggravating the hag further. I will not be kept away from this brief freedom by your machinations. We should have convened at the villa. Why? The chief shrugs. That's my private home. The tribe's meeting place is here. I think Regara has to say concerns the tribe. You'll decide not to offend the feast because the human is your problem, not mine. I'm here then, aren't I? The pudgy female scoffs, which Vitha flushes his brows. Unfortunately. Very well then, I'll have them set up the elders' table. With a single paw wave, the chief gestures towards the bunnies, who nod in affirmation. While they take a single step, the annoying screeching continues. No, I won't be sitting far away from earshot. Well, I'm afraid there's simply no space here. He states plainly as Regara takes a spot again. I see two empty seats. Well, this one's Marissa. Should she join us for your duties at the Den of Vigil? Well, that's a Dalron spot. It's bad luck to take the seat of a missing Alpha. Ritha responds nonchalantly, but it's hard not to notice the slight satisfaction he draws from refusing her a spot. I'm not sure if it's bullshit or a real custom. I'm glad she's not sitting with us. Then who can do what he's meant to do and serve? 
Be the guest at our table, not a servant. A guest? Audrey shrieks in a natural tone, causing Regard to turn to her with an irritated sneer. Speaking truthfully, I don't think you'd fit between us anyway. The female makes a clear jab at Audrey's voluptuous figure, and I chuckle discreetly. I'm in no mood to handle my own table after nearly three weeks in the field. Oh, quite right. The chief nods in agreement. The entitled female only crosses her arms in defiance. I'll stand then. Do as you please, as long as you do it in silence. He shrugs indifferently, clearly losing interest in verbal spars with that vile woman. Seeing their leader began piling up his plate, the other wolves help themselves wherever they please. Considering my previous waiter is separated from me by an overgrown and well endowed wall of she wolf, I decide to help myself as well. I reached some roasted veg and what I assume are chickens, or pheasants or whatever, when to my surprise Regara beats me to it. She holds up the plate above my own, nodding towards the knife and fork, clearly expecting me to grab wherever I please. I nod in gratitude and take some root vegetables, along with a nice piece of grilled breast. Where's your gallant champion? Vitter asks out loud, looking mockingly at Aldris, while licking his fingers after stacking his plate high with various meats. I honestly can't remember the last time I saw you on your own. He's fetching it now. The female huffs, still standing challenging in front of our table. Ah, I see you intend to put on a spectacle again. I intend to ensure proper governance in the face of these mountain crises. And speaking of spectacles and mountain crises... The brown male snorts and bops his glass in the direction we just spotted Dran. He leads to Nell, pulling her by the rim of her shawl as if she were a dog, the frail female barely able to keep up with his pace. What a massive asshole. I'm sorry it took so long. She kept oh, stopping every few paces. The male barely wheezes out, almost as if he's about to pass out. And Nell, on the other hand, corrects her dress. Not a bead of sweat on her body. Well, that justifies disgusting treatment anyway. Oh my, the weather is quite lovely tonight, isn't it? Yes, yes, you've said it at least ten times already. Dran snarls at her in annoyance, while the female takes an idle look across the surrounding tables. Oh, tell me, why are we here again? We come to the feast because Regara. Oh, how extraordinary. And Nell claps her hands, interrupting Aldrich to her utter exasperation. You must have read my mind, Dwayne. It's Dran! He sneers through clenched teeth, but the venerable female just ignores him. You know, I think I've gone to eat lunch today. I am uh, quite peckish. Had it not for my neck, I would lose my head. She chuckles softly, then focuses on the chief, genuflecting as deeply as she can, considering her age. Despite taking a shallow dip, she still did so with much more grace and respect than the other two elders could ever muster. My chief. By now? The chief returns a gesture with a nod of acknowledgement. The older female looks back to her friends. Shall we go to our table, then? If memory serves me well, it was... We are not going to the damn table. We'll be standing. Oh, standing? Whatever for. And now blinks, but all just waves at her with a paw. Never you mind. She snaps, looking at the chief with growing anger. All I can think of is that poor ancient female dragged through the town by that heavy poured brute. Well, that's a shame. My knees are not what they used to be. Mother always said it's bad for me to upright. No, I cannot take this anymore. I simply stand up and walk towards the female, gently sipping my hand underneath her arm to everyone's surprise. Oh, hello there, dearie. What is he doing? Why is he touching her? Aldous nearly rushes at me, but now stops over the risen paw. Oh, it's quite all right. No harm done. Oh, I remember him. He's that cheeky little devil from the villa. Well, I wonder what mischief is he up to now? She smiles, patting my hand. I smile back and nod towards the table, leading her to my spot and helping her to take a seat. 
I hear Aldrich's heavy breath and she gets more and more infuriated, reminiscent of an old steam locomotive. Now that I think about it, a proper zoological term for a female canine would be a bitch. Which, I guess, means one would be perfectly justified in calling Aldrich an old, fat bitch. Oh, moon bless you, child, you needn't have. Actually, I have. I wouldn't be able to sit here watching you stand. Besides, it allows me to do what I want to do in the first place. As I'm about to leave, taking a long U-turn around the table, I hear Aldrich's heavy breathing erupting into another shouting spree. So she can sit, but not us! What can I do? Not my fault an ape doesn't understand us. Yeah, fuck you, bitch. I'm a dumb ape. Besides, size-wise, there's not much a difference anyway. Regara shrugs, and I struggle to contain another satisfied smirk of their jabs. But now the hag is growling outright, showing her teeth on full display, and I can't help myself. I am not be here to serve tonight, but to piss her off, I'll do one better. I grab a spare goblet and fill it up with wine, bringing it back to Anel, who takes it with both surprise and gratitude. Why, thank you. It's just what I needed. Feels like I've been in a forced march. Yeah, I saw I walk back around the table with a gratified smirk, take my rightful spot beside Rana, who showers me with proud gazes. Seeing she's making a spectacle of herself, the pudgy female shakes her head and paws, almost as if dismissing the whole thing. Right, let's get this started. Where's a rush? The chief asks in a slightly mocking tone. Oh, I've just returned. Let them at the very least get some refreshments first. Oh, v- very well. Aldris grumbles in annoyance and crosses her arms while everyone returns to simply enjoying their meals. Rannock takes the opportunity to pour me a glass of wine, giving me a tender smile. Still left my previous plate on the other side, he motions the array of meals in front of us, and I simply nod towards some roasted potatoes and ham. The wolf sets up a generous portion, drowning it all in a handsome amount of gravy, and I can't help but lick my lips in anticipation. As he sets the plate in front of me, the chief leans in, looking at us in confusion. Why are you serving him? Rogara said he looks too scrawny. Rannock shrugs and I nearly choke on my wine. Well, that he does. The female nods, raising a cup towards mine and I do the same. Well, he's been eating a little ever since I found him. Or if I won't set him a portion, I'm afraid he'll starve himself to death. Peculiar. The male sounds intrigued, but quickly dismisses it and returns to his friend. Who is that new? And now pokes the overgrown female in the arm, pointing to a clearly visible fresh wound. I'm sure it wasn't the last time we saw each other. Hey, yep, I remember the moment of my very first battle. Regara pumps up her chest, responding with pride in her voice. Ah, but you'll learn to cherish it. The elder female nods, grabbing the rim of her shawl and dress, pulling them down over her arm to reveal the upper chest. Here's my very own. An arrow wedged itself right into my shoulder blade. She points to a faded spot just beneath her collarbone. I'm no surgeon. That one seems too close to the heart for comfort. But Nell seems happy with it. I'd show you my last one, but... She frowns teasingly, leaning and whispering in the hushed tone. I'm afraid the set isn't quite appropriate for such a thing. Our side of the table erupts in laughter. Even Vol lets out a moose chuckle. Ah, you're damn legend to now. Oh, she had half your tails to tell by the time my fur turns grey. Ah, I'll drink to that. The black male raises his cup. We all make a toast in honour of the female. My, she must have been quite a character in her youth. Once we all take a sip, she smiles at us with slight pity. Oh, I would wish my life on any of you, but I fear you all get your fair share of misadventures soon enough. Her voice is quite sombre and puts a damper on the jovial atmosphere. The wolves exchange confused glances. The older female has already moved on. She turns back to her standing friends and speaks up. Oh, Val, dearie, why don't you take a seat? This must be murder on your ankles. I'm Aldris! 
the pudgy female growls in annoyance, and I can hardly contain the snicker at these misnaming antics. Oh, indeed, uh, forgive me. And now shakes her head absentmindedly and looks at the chief. Uh, should we get the wards to fetch them some stools, at least? The male nods at the suggestion and signals Trist, who is scrambling between the far-off tables. I'm glad to finally see him, as he rushes behind the screen and try to give him an encouraging smile, but he's too busy to notice. He eventually returns with Leaf at his side, both bringing a small stool each for the old wolves to sit on. They're not exactly right, though, obviously if they were meant for pups. And considering the pavilion is built on a platform, the seated elders now look comically low in comparison. Orders and Dran feel like kids sent to the principal's office, and the humour isn't lost on the chief, who immediately erupts in laughter. <laughs> oh, you almost look like you're put on trial. Are you sure you'll be more comfortable at your own table? You would love that, wouldn't you? The pudgy female sneers, rubbing her butt all over the stool to get more comfortable. Oh, not really. You two are completely indifferent to me, if I'd be honest. I think you make yourself look like fools. You always thought yourself witty, but you show for everyone to see the insult you inflict upon us. She plies in a risen voice as to draw the attention of the nearby wolves, then pointing towards Anel. Why is it she gets to sit at the table while we're treated? Again, I did not for a seat. Your cause with the humour, not me. The chief shrugs while the tiny female looks around with worry and attempts to get up. Well, I'm happy to give it up if there's any trouble. No, love, you stay where you are. Regara puts a paw on her shoulder, pushing her nail back into a seat. This is the Alpha's table. Ritha joins in with a different tone. Technically speaking, Anel was an Alpha, unlike the two of you. Uh, 23 years and 89 days. The best time of my life. She nods with a smile, proudly recounting the tenure with said title. But while we made my accomplishments, the other two seemed to take issue. Of course you always valid brute force over reason. Are they ever going to shut up? Regara whispers towards Vol, only snorts in amusement, looking at her now with a risen brow. I understand how you managed all those years. Oh, it's getting quite loud here, isn't it? She muses, again falling into a senile wolf act. Oh, I've been in two sieges in my lifetime. The female shrugs, pushing a glass towards the centre of the table, clearly asking someone to refill her cup. Since this time she's away from my reach, it falls to full to do the honours. Siege weapons do your head in. The endless rustle of chains and clanking of wood followed by the thundering impact of the stone against the ramparts. Listen to her carefully as Wolf fills her cup. The other two elders continue their quibble with the chief. But eventually, it all blends into a buzz at the back of your mind. If you can survive that, any ruckus becomes just a backdrop. Did you just call them a background noise? Come to think of it, when you have better things to do, they do fade into the surroundings perfectly. Almost like the crackling of the flames. Once you're used to it being there, it's barely noticeable. How are you going to start this year and eventually all your intention to delay this until the morning? On the contrary, I don't want to hear you hold you here a minute longer than necessary. So I need them to have a moment's respite. He looks towards both Ranok and Regara. Well, you two feel refreshed? Both wolves nod, the chief waves his paw towards the towering female. Well, in your own time then, recount exactly what transpired out there. Regara bows respectfully and stands up. She clears her throat and nods towards Wolf to refill the glass. Once the black wolf obliged, she hastily empties the goblet and gestures for another round. This time she keeps the filled cup in her paw, most likely to wet her lips as her story continues. When she's about to open her muzzle, dead silence falls over the ground, and every wolf leans in to better hear. At first it seemed like nothing. Disturbed forest floor and broken foliage. I assumed there were perhaps poachers encroaching on our territory. Nothing major, I mean, it happened before. The female shrugs and the gathered nod in agreement. We followed the tracks for a bit, only to find the party was much larger than initially anticipated. 
Maybe 10 or 15 individual sets of tracks. I said, so case, why do you need to one of the outer packs? Dry interrupts when the female looks in with surprise. Because there was 14 of us there. If I knew Dalro was nearby and there were intruders, I would rather not leave them uncontested. So you regroup then? The chief guesses. The female shakes her head. I know. Before we even had a chance to change course, I saw a massive black cloud rise above the treetops. She points towards the forest surrounding the grounds, and many look in that direction. It was the thickest smoke I've ever seen. A column of ash and soot three hundred feet tall. During this, the gather begin murmuring between each other, clearly unsettled by the revelation. I knew that wherever Dalran was, he would have seen it too. So we set our course, hoping the other pack would converge on us there. Well, good call. With a nod in approval, Rogara takes a deep gulp of wine. Her eyes venture the earth beneath her paws, and her jaw shivers a little as she struggles to recount the tale. I... I wasn't prepared to see what happened there. The intruders put an entire lap in burrow to torch and sword. They took the young ones and butchered everyone else, including the livestock, while setting fire to everything around. This caused an outrage amongst the gathered, with many howling and screaming in anger, while the chief and Vithra exchanged troubled gazes. I myself find my worried eyes venture to Rannoch, and Olaf tries to give me an encouraging smile. I can see it's just a front. You are all right to be outraged, so are we. She downs the last contents of her cup and brings it back to Vul, where he fills it without delay. We are outraged. We wanted vengeance. We wanted to pursue and catch whoever committed this atrocity. If the fires were left unchecked, they would have spread. The bastards who started them did so on purpose, knowing full well we'd be tied down trying to stop the inferno. Barrow, uh, which, uh, please... I noticed Trist approach the table, toy nervously with his fingers, and I could see he's struggling to contain tears. My heart goes out to him. I keep repeating to myself, please don't let it be his home. Tina and Crop. Regaro responds with a wavering voice. An audible sigh of relief escapes the brown rabbit's lips. I don't worry, Trist. Your family is safe. All your families are safe. She dresses the remaining bunnies, only continue with a hushed, sorrowful voice. I can't say the same for those poor sods. She takes a shallow sip of wine and closes my eyes, giving thanks to whichever god has answered my prayer. Still, no one deserves such a fate, despite the somewhat good news. Most of the attendants are still understandably upset. Just as Tris told me a few days back, his people are always the ones who get hit by anything those wolves do. Who gets a rat's ass about the damned rabbits? Dran spits out with annoyance. That's what happened to my son. Wait, his son? Delron arrived within a few hours of us. He was equally shaken by the devastation and rushed to our aid. Despite our joint efforts, it was clear the fires wouldn't be taken out for a long while, given the perpetrators he left time to escape with our people in chains. Again, the female is forced to take another sip. Can't believe she's able to maintain such good humour at the table, despite carrying such horror within. A village of wolves in masks. It's clear, though, that recounting the tale makes hers crack, almost as if she's reliving it anew. This wouldn't stand, not with us. Dalaran and I knew that one of us have to stay and stop the fires, but I was willing to forgo the privilege of bringing the bandits to justice, so we gambled for it. She shrugs casually, causing some to chuckle. I tell her how lucky Gitty is. One, and his impact immediately left. And you just let him? Grand sounds completely outraged when the female doesn't budge. Believe me, it gave me no joy playing the forest ranger or he went off the battle. Our duty is both to the people and the land, and the land was bleeding. Unless we wanted the carbon makeover our northern reaches, there was no other choice. Regara states sternly, despite Duran's intense protest, both the gathered seem to agree with the female. As we continued our struggle to continue contain the flames, we found one survivor among the wreckage. It was a deer king, a young druid, badly wounded. We managed to patch him up. As thanks, he offered his services in bringing the criminals to justice. 
He claimed he could commune with the forest and keep an eye on the other pack. She pokes her head playfully, rolling her eyes as some of the wolves snicker. I know, I know. At first I was sceptical as anyone would. I'd never seen any real magic in action, so I ignored him. I wish I was wiser. He knew those woods better than anyone could, found paths otherwise unseen by any rangers. So I began to listen, cautiously but still. Vima pauses, allowing the gather to settle down. The following day the trees told that Dalron reached his queer quarry, released the slaves and killed the poachers. A fanciful tale, I thought, but one detail caught me off guard. The druid claimed there were only four enemies killed and the forest warned of others at large. But he knew there were at least fourteen, so it became clear it was a trap and the druid wasn't making it up. Our sylvan magic rubbish to all of that! Audrey scoffs in amusement, waving to one of the attendants to bring a wine. My son would never kill another wolf! Dran added, waving his well and waiting to be served in turn. It was this comment makes Rannoch's lips curl up in a subdued snarl. You weren't there! The female responds raspily through a taunting growl. You haven't seen what we've seen, what those wolves have done. It was perverse, going against everything our people stand for. The way I see it, they weren't wolves at all, but raven beasts need to be put down. How can you say such a thing about our kin? Aldous shifts uncomfortably, contempt for Agara's words clear in her voice. Because they were intent on carrying those atrocities across the entire border, and they're stopped. And how would you know that? Dran challenges her, retrieving his goblet from Trist. The trees spoke to the deer, they told him. The trees again? Aldous sneers with annoyance. The trees don't speak, you gullible girl. The deer took you for a fool you were. Again. Regara blinks, snarling and released an exasperated sigh. You weren't there. He knew things he could not have possibly known. Like what? He knew of Rannoch's coming of age, for one. Everyone invested in the tribe's politics were known of Rannoch's coming of age. The pudgy female raises her hand and slaps him against her knees. He's one step away from being a damn prince the way Farrakh treats him. He knew of the human as well. Regara adds, causing the others to whisper between themselves in confusion. In fact, with one revelation, she sees the attention of all the gathered. He said the trees spoke of him incessantly, almost of his sudden arrival has shaken the entire forest to its core. Why would the forest be speaking of this human? That's I do not know. The female says in a defeated tone, taking another sip from a cup. But if you need more proof, his constant warnings about incoming attacks were flawless. He predicted all enemy movements, and thanks to that we were able to encounter any ambushes. Ambushes? As I said, Dalran only caught four intruders, which meant at least ten of them were still at large. We repelled the first attack with ease, we soon got clear we were being tested. Tested? The chief finally pitches in. He's oddly quiet throughout the entire exchange, most likely taking in everything Regara was saying. Whatever they were doing, they did not try to kill us outright. First it almost seemed like a rather intense training regime. They checked out our alertness, our combat skill, and then disengaged. You think they're trying to get the measure of you? Bitha raises his brow. His face is oddly stoic, almost emotionless. That would be my guess, yes. Why did you allow that, then? Fran chastises her annoyance. Why didn't you pursue them once they ended their games? I wouldn't be taking combat advice from a wolf who never wielded a weapon in his life. Regara tours, roars a collective gasp from the gathered, or with it goes as far to chuckle. That's exactly what they were counting on. We are outnumbered and surrounded, strong only as a unit. The moment we disperse, they'd pick us off one by one. Oh, well said. Again, Vithra agrees with her assessment, raising his cup in admiration. The female thanks him with a gentle head bow. I had a good teacher. She mutters, drawing a proud smile from the brown male's muzzle. I had to stay firm and stand together. See, their tactics didn't work. The enemy tried to wear us out by depriving us from sleep. 
This was no lost hunting party. Those were seasoned warriors trying to kill us slowly, one by one, like stalked prey. Well, very much seems like it. The chief nods, calmly reaching for a clay bottle. Once he pours himself a tall glass of moonshine, begin to realise this is quite serious. Oh, as yet, they're waiting for reinforcements. The drew told me there's another party entering Tiernan from the north, or at least a dozen. He gave me no reason not to believe his words, so our situation was getting desperate. What more proof do we need? The chief spreads his arms and bangs the table. It's an invasion. An invasion? You've lost your mind. You're taking this girl's word for it. Well, it's not a story spun by another kin, nonetheless. The two elders continue their unbearable mockery. How do they do such a thing in the face of Regara's harrowing account? What am I thinking? Of course they can. They're massive cunts. Southern folk are known for their deep connection to nature. It's where our own traditions take source. The name trees to name a few. Don't be absurd. Do you honestly believe a deer spoke with trees? She sneers. This time it's Vithru who bangs the table in anger. I look at the male who bears his fangs freely. Entire first stand up in barely contained rage. I speak with my soulmate's tree every night thanks to you. Am I being absurd, woman? Oh, I, I dozed off again. And now stirs from one of her stupors and blinks in the dim light of candles. Considering the time that they were so far, I'm more and more convinced she does it on purpose. Oh my, it has gotten incredibly chilly. She mutters, shivering, and I pull up Rannoch's cape. The woman looks at me confused and I nod towards Anel. Realising what I mean to do, he smiles at me approvingly and unpins the cloak from his pauldron. Once it's free, I fold it onto my arm and walk around the table, with everyone looking at me with slight surprise as I drape the cloak around the elder's shoulder. Oh, my word, you're reading my mind, you lovable beastie. She smiles, pulling the cloak tighter around her shoulders while I pour, pour another glass of wine. Considering she might be actually cold, I also nod towards the moonshine bottle, and she smiles at me knowingly. Oh, go on, why not? She snickers teasingly, and I uncork the top, pour a dash into a wine. Oh, thank you ever so much. Oh, what a charming little fella. Perhaps you should be escorted back home, Anel. With his anger is now completely melted away, he looks at the female with genuine concern. Oh, no, no, it's quite all right now, thank you. She waves a paw at him. I haven't felt this taken care of in quite some time. I'm low, so let it end so soon. The female turns to shake my arm in gratitude, and I smile, noticing Vitha's approving nod. I realise what she's doing. Every time things begin to spiral, she diffuses the tension with masterful precision. As I return to my place, the chief looks towards Ogara, to his little spat an opportunity to have her cup refilled. She's going through those at an alarming pace. At the same time, can I blame her? What she described so far sounds like living hell. You are saying about the ambushes and incoming enemy reinforcements? Yes. The large female nods, trying to muster the courage to say what needed to be said. I was worried this would be our end, but thanks to the druid we were able to counteract every move of the enemy. However, the time was running out. In fear of the ambushes kept failing, they eventually figured out that the deer was our highest. One night, they decided to attack us in full force in an open battle. She dips her lips in wine and takes a shallow hover of air. Again, I thought it was one of their tests. This time they fought until they fell. It was a gambit. They sacrificed two of their own so they could get to the deer and deliver him a deadly blow. That's when I got this. Regara points the scar on her forearm. And that's when Frillin and Nair got wounded. Our only consolation was he managed to kill two of the sons of bitches. Once their task was accomplished, they scattered into the woods like cowards. So you admit you killed your fellow wolves? Duran speaks in the accusatory tone as if seeking outrage from the gathered. To his surprise, no one shares his sentiment. Fellow, they tried to kill us. She didn't want any true wolf would do. She stood her ground and fought for her life. What we'll happened next? With her urges are on, clearly intrigued by the events. 
As he was dying, the druid managed to give me one final warning. He revealed that help was on its way. He said Ranunk left looking for us, and all I had to do was wait out two more nights. What? The chief had his in disbelief, almost sounding amazed by her words. I looked for my wolf in confusion. We hunkered down, buried the deer as its custom for his kind, and waited. Waited to live, to fight, to die. Waited for Ranok to finally arrive. It was getting gruesome. Although fewer in numbers, they made up for it in ferocity. Or they were out for blood. Can you blame them? You killed two of their own. At times, I do have to wonder whose side you're on. The male issues a subdued growl to which Aldris only scoffs. On the side of reason! Let her finish her account for crying out loud. Ritha bangs the table once more. This patience is clearly wearing thin. Continue, please, and pay them no mind. By the dawn of the third day, we're on our last legs. We would have all perished had Ranuk not arrived when he did, right amid their final assault. I can barely contain tears from creeping onto my eyes. Had we not argued? Had we not had our heart to heart? He might not have left. It's hard to understand the lives of so many hinged on something seemingly so unrelated. Immediately I ventured to verse his words about fate. Before I can allow my emotions to spiral, Regara casts a gaze in our direction. Her muzzle beams with pride she looks toward Rannoch with utter devotion. You should have seen him. He sent it on the enemy like the great wolf spirit himself. No hesitation, no fear. He cut down two of those fuckers with one fell swoop, inspiring the rest of us to bring out what fighting spirit was left in our body. It was glorious. We fought like we never fought in our lives. Her breath becomes heavy and continuously blink away the tears, trying not to look at Ranok as pretty much every eye was now fixated on him. I can see his father's proud expression as Regara delivers a testimony, and I share in his awe, but Ranok's oddly uncomfortable. If not for him, I wouldn't be here. None of us would have returned. She raises her cup and everyone does the same, standing to their feet. Since it's not really a verbal cue, I'm free to do the same and everyone cheers in one single voice. To Rannoch! It's clear the Grey Wolf does not know how to take this. He seems embarrassed by the unanimous display of admiration. But if what Regara says is true, he deserves it and so much more. In fact, it makes me feel quite embarrassed. I was only serving lunch and fetching ingredients while they were out there fighting for their lives. Pretty much my worst predictions came true, and I feel so sorry for him. Once the cheers die down a bit and everyone gets settled, Regara continues with the story. With Rannoch's help, we repel the final assault, ready to pursue the escaping few wolves we didn't cut down. That's when their leader finally revealed himself. He's oddly confident and smug, asking us for terms or waving a piece of paper in the air as if it were his shield. I would have none of it. She states all the disgust she could muster. Ranok wanted to hear him out, and I don't blame him. But he didn't see what those wolves did to the burrow. No, that bastard was my quarry. I would have my revenge for all the suffering inflicted upon our land, so I challenged him to a duel instead. Despite him asking for terms? Dran snarls in outrage. Again, he and Aldry seemed the only ones playing the devil's advocate. I cared not for his terms. He was dead meat to me. Regara spits on the ground, and surprisingly the vast majority of the gathered cheer for her. I said to him, if he defeats me, my blood debt dies with me, and he can parley with whomever he pleases. But if he wants to parley, it'll be over my dead body. Many wolves rise up to their feet and begin applauding the utter horror of the elders. The entire field fills with ovations that don't seem to die out, and eventually the chief is forced to get up and settle him down with gentle waving of his paws. Huh, I'm pressed you decided to take him on, despite being exhausted after an entire week of fighting. Ritha mutters in approval as his friend takes back his seat. I was hoping he thought the same would see me as an easy win. The fool accepted. Well, you were on your last legs. The chief smirks in amusement and Regara shakes her head in jest. You have no idea, chief, what glorious second wind burning hatred can be. Well, actually, I can, and I applaud your valour. 
and Chief bows his head towards her, causing Dran to stand up and growl. Glorifying mindless violence. Glorifying bravery, actually. I understand the distinction might be lost on cowards. Dran's about to rush the table. Broadus pulls him back into his seat. What happened next? She demands. This time she's the one already invested in the following events, rubbing her paws in clear frustration. Everyone's probably expecting some spectacular duel. But in truth, all I did was deflect his first swing and crack his skull open like a soft-boiled egg. Regar displays a pause pitifully in clear disappointment. The account is much to the crowd's content, and they gather cheer and laugh once more. As he fell to the ground, his brain splattered all over the forest floor. I was able to calm down enough to recognise him. He was my intended. The female shrugs, with many muttering between each other in the far-off tables. I haven't seen that twerp in ten years, but I would recognise him anywhere. Had a gross spurt, that's for sure. Leading the pack, he was born into it. I guess that became the end of his military and political career. She scoffs mockingly, reaching towards a pouch at her belt and removing from it a crumpled envelope. That's the paper he was waving. The female brings it over the table and passes it to the chief. Watch intently as he hastily opens it, removing from it a rather nice-looking parchment with a wax seal at the very bottom. Well, that's a galite from Gildiran, signed by Vortican himself. Exhales in surprise, passing over to Vitha. To whom it may concern. The brown wolf reads out loud with amusement. The bearer of this letter is entitled... He nods in surprise. To all accommodation, protection and assistance befitting his liege lord, signed Vortican by the graceful Luna, Chief of Gildiran, Lord of the Northern Pass and Protector of the Sylvan Folk. Recounts the title with an exasperated sigh, while the gather began to chatter in quite a confusion. Uh, quite a protector, indeed. Why don't you style yourself like that, by the grace for Luna and all that rubbish? Ritha throws mockingly at his friend, which he only snickers. Oh, my big son, our insecure prick. I think about it, you could be the chief of Tien and lord of here, there, and protector of the feasting table. The brown male continues his joke to the growing amusement of the gathered. And then again, it would make introductions a rather tedious affair. Are you two done plain jesters? Audris finally interrupts this, standing up and approaching the table. That foolish girl just admitted killing an envoy for the chief, her intended nonetheless, and yet you sit here and mess around. She snatches the document from Vitha's paws and begins to read it intently, while Agara shrugs. What else am I supposed to do? Kiss him and show him the way to the next burrow? The large female draws a fit of laughter from the gathered. The fucker attacked me. He thought he was good enough to take me down. Now his cracked skull decorates the northern border. I think we've accommodated him perfectly. Vitha quips, then again the gathered chuckle. Don't you think this could cause reprisal? The pudgy female ignores Vitha completely and waves a document in front of the chief's amused muzzle. Oh, I'd love for Vortigan to inquire about his missing diplomatic mission. In person, I bet. This is serious! I'm sorry, am I missing something here? Those were foreign wolves invading our land, desecrating our forest. Isn't that what our patrol duty is meant to prevent? Has our role changed from wardens to wards while I was away? Typical brutish mindset. Aura shoves the paper back into the chief's paws, marching back to his seat. Ah, next time I'm out in the field, I'll take a picnic basket just in case we stumble against another foray. We shall serve them refreshments. Invading's a thirsty job after all. Another round of cheer fills the ground to Aldrich's dismay, while Dran stands up, shaking his head in disbelief. No, 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 this makes no sense. No sense at all. Why would Vortigan send ruffians to attack our burrows and then arm them with letters of safe conduct? Perhaps he wants to send a message. With a response seriously, previous tone of mockery gone from his voice. To whom? To us, or to our subjects. The chief shrugs, crumbling the letter and tossing it aside. I don't know, and frankly I don't care. This demands satisfaction. Satisfaction? 
You sound as bloodthirsty as that mad girl. She said herself that she killed an entire pack while we suffered no losses. We lost a whole burrow along with the druid ally. Regara corrects the angry female with a bitter tone. You know damn well that Etherkin don't count. I know no such thing. As an alpha, I swore on the moon herself to protect all denizens of Tiernan. I notice a subtle smile appear on Anel's otherwise peaceful muzzle, but quickly shuddering in surprise as Ranok stands up. Here, yeah, yeah. He raises his mug, causing quite a few others to hear this, do the same, and I smile at my wolf. How can she always come first? Be that as it may, we can't allow a rule of a burrow to be left unanswered. The chief leans uncomfortably, shaking his head in annoyance and forcing Ranok to sit down again. Do you want to start a war with our northern brethren over some buddies? You haven't been there. The smell of burned flesh carried on the wind. The charred skeletons of centennial trees. This wasn't just a raid, this was evil, pure and sinful. Yes, war is horrible, girl. What other great insights have you to offer? Aldous snaps dismissively and looks at the chief. Things like this happen. They've always happened. The Sylvan folk were under our protection. What is that protection worth when others can undermine it with impunity? I think that first we need to try and resolve this diplomatically. Perhaps it's all just a misunderstanding. Duran proposes nervously. It's clearly starting to take it slightly more seriously than Aldris does. I think I understood quite well that our lives were on the line. We were five nights straight away hounded by the enemy. Perhaps Gildiran had a harsh winter? Pudgyfema proposes in a desperate attempt to explain this away. I mean, three times in a row our own supplies ran short, and maybe four to six eight to replenish his granaries. I'd hardly hold on par on our robbery and murder with the neighbour asking to borrow some turnips. With the mocks her again, and once more Aldris is exposed to ridicule from the gathered. Seeing this, Dran feels compelled to rush your defence, challenging the entire, entire central table. Your heart are all the same, clambering for combat, combat wherever you can. This dumb bitch might have just as well started a war, yet you applaud her for it. I blink as do many others, always looking intently at Regaro, whose entire form tenses as she grips her hammer tightly. When you've truly been to battle. I've just been to battle, you pathetic den warmer. She snarls viciously, causing the old male to stumble over his stool. You spent your entire life hiding behind your desk and quill, or at least this bitch is good. If you ever speak to me that way again, I'll demand satisfaction in the ring. Well, it's twice now Dran you've invoked on the tribesal's wrath. For a diplomat, your people's skills are somewhat lacking. Well, I guess like everything, that too went away with age. An awkward silence falls on the gathered, but with it quickly breaks here with another quip. Perhaps he just practiced new brand of diplomacy Vortigan medals with. He draws a reluctant chuckle from some of the wolves, while Aldris looks to a defeated friend with worry. What of Delran? Where's he now? We couldn't look for him. There were too many wounded among us, and we had to bring him back home. So you just left him out there alone? Dran calls out in shock, but Regar only shrugs. Rana could leave us without an escort in case more wolves were hiding within our woods. Besides, in the last report I had from the druid, Dalron's pack was headed to the burrow to leave the refugees there. He's our most experienced alpha. I'm sure that once his business is concluded, he'll return to us as hastily as possible. He'd better do. The fat male grumbles as if it were a threat. Trust in the word of another kin. Aldous sneers, joining his discontent and causing an outburst of chatter among the tables. The chief stands up and repeatedly clangs his cup like a gavel to simmer everyone down. Well, there you have it. I think it's clear we have to invoke a howl. So the wolves nod in agreement. Aldous quickly puts an end to it with another shouting spree. A howl? This is absurd! Were you threatening me with one just the other day? He scoffs at her mockingly. If you send the word out to all our wolves, it's bound to be picked up by the neighbouring tribes. It will raise questions. Good, I'll also make it the same twice while violating our borders. With his snickers, pouring himself some more wine. I warn you, Varakua! Not interested in your counsel, I'm afraid. Nor for your warnings, for that matter. He shrugs, regarding the gathered at our table. 
Well, I need to support the Alpha as a contender when the elders to summon the Howl, and I will get there. I will not leave our people paralyzed with action by your intrigues. You should go against us, I promise you, your position. I don't give a damn about my position as well. He states plainly in a risen voice, rolling his eyes in annoyance and causing the majority of the gather to gasp. Depose me for all it matters. Who will you place me with? There's not a wolf anywhere in this forest. If you turn every single damn stone, there will stand a better chance of contesting me than Vitha. He points to his friend, who at first is slightly surprised to be pulled into this argument, but his humour quickly returns. And I'll gladly trade places with him. It is half the ruling for me anyway. He could be my advisor for a change. The brown male proposes cheekily and many chuckle at the remark. I'm glad you accept it, my friend. Just see the look on their dumb muzzles. I'm sure it'd make this little switcheroo worth their time. How dare you mock us like this? Dran growls in anger, the chief only laughs. Oh, mock? Oh, I'm just stating a fact, yeah. Who do you plan to replace me with? With there's more popular sport than any of your imaginary candidates could ever have. The two cunts exchange surprised looks. It seems they have found themselves at yet another impasse. I must admit, I enjoy seeing their bewildered expression. They sit there on those undersized stools like naughty children in the timeout. The chief, on the other hand, takes his adult-sized seat with satisfaction, clinking his cup with Vithrin a triumphant toast. I suggest we let the emotion settle down before we discuss the vote further. Perhaps you should go and eat something, or have a drink. I'm sure the shouting did a number on your throat. Amen to that. I might have quietly under my breath, reaching my cup to take a sip and causing Ralank to chuckle. I watch his order squeeze the fist in annoyance, but otherwise doesn't move. We will remain where we are. Oh, suit yourself. The chief shrugs and the table returns to idle chatter. I finally nibble on my food. My appetite kind of went away with Agara's story, but at the same time, I'm quite hungry. Despite how terrible all this, it all has sounded, both she and Ranak look quite normal, merrily joking with friends, enjoying their meals as if nothing happened. Perhaps because they were prepared for something like this their entire life, but something tells me they're just repressing their emotions in a most unhealthy fashion. We stay like this for some time, the elders watching as our revelry continues. There's an obvious celebratory mood, with Agara being almost like a guest of honour. From time to time, different wolves come by our table to clink their chalices with the towering female and find her provenly on the back. No wonder, she gave an innocent celebrity with a story. The congratulating and limited just her, many cheer Ranok as a saviour of her sister pack. I look with pride as my wolf receives all the praise he rightfully deserves, even though he feels rather awkward about it. It's nice to have the dinner shift to this lighter mood. Eventually, Cora shows up, rushing towards the table with a troubled expression. Oh, I'm sorry for being late. One well, of the young ones was teething and had trouble falling asleep. Hello, love. I've heard from Vior about your deal. Oh, terribly sorry about all that. She scratches Ranok's chin and then nods tidily towards Dragara. But you both are safe and sound. That's all that matters. I hear a gasp escape Ranok's throat as Cora lands merrily inside his lap, brushing her back against my shoulder. What is she doing here? Audrey sneers, looking to go with a powerful disdain and clearly reliving our morning spat. I'm here to keep our returning hero some company and congratulate him on a job well done. The tawny female responds, as in Ranok's cheeks softly and I struggle not to get jealous again. And you allow her at the table but not us? Well, technically she's not sitting on the table. She's not even seated on the bench. The chief shrugs, sneaking satisfied glances at his boy. She is it on some wood, though, that's for sure. Vitha pipes up, raising his cup and causing the gather to burst into laughter. The only ones not sharing the amusement of this classy joke are the elders and the couple in question. Fuck me, if they had to do this on a regular basis, no wonder they decided to comply with the charade. I sit next to them quietly, trying not to be jealous. This time it's much easier, not only because I like Cora, but also because I know it's not something either one wants to do to begin with. Not to mention, every now and then Cora leans back with her entire body, stretching like a cat, she could reach my head and scratch it. It's pleasant, 
but at the same time he gives me a front view of her cleavage and puts her entire torso on display, like a smorgasbord for Rannoch to drool over. He might not want to, but I can clearly see he's getting somewhat flustered. How can I blame him? I'm also getting flushed by the way she bends her slender body, it does something to be on a fundamental level. How could this not entice other males? What is wrong with this tribe that catch like this must parade itself with a flashy lure like Rallock to draw attention? None of what these wolves do makes any damn sense. I just close my eyes and lose myself on occasional scratches. But as the time passes, Cora gets more and more frisky, with the paws go up and down Rannoch's torso. I always looks to see up the game of getting me jealous. Oh, maybe I'm just taking it too personally. But one thing is sure, they, or well, at least she, is going fully at it, so Rannoch gets extremely worked at the point even the elders notice. Shouldn't they get her room? Or a rather shameless display? Oh, puppy love, what can you do? I don't like two of you know anything about it. Almost emboldened by her father, Cora giggles so theatrically that it sounds comical. Worse yet, Tanner gives me those, one of those self-satisfied smirks, and again I'm getting incredibly frustrated. Watch with surprise and growing angry, he takes hold of Rannoch's muzzle and dove towards his ear, whispering some sweet nothings, and then... She nibbles on it, causing Rannoch to go utterly red with embarrassment. Is she fucking drunk? All right, all right, break it up, you two. That she finally interrupts this, we does so in a teasing manner, almost taking deep satisfaction from the spectacle. Rana only stands up, petrified, helping the female to get to her own feet. Oh, see you later, handsome. She blows him a kiss and he slaps her buttocks mechanically, allowing her to skip away to her own table. Something's off, though. First I thought she simply took the game too far. Rana's expression shows he's more concerned than turned on, despite the clearly visible bulge in his crotch. Oh, I need to take a leak. He mumbles awkwardly, looking to his father who waves his paw at him to give leave. Ah, sure you do. With her teases, draw a new snort from the chief who waves his paw at his son. Oh, come. Rank logs, nods begrudgingly and throws in my direction. I get up, slightly confused, only to freeze still as the chief looks in my direction. Whatever did you need him for? I... The wolf pauses, looking back at them absent-mindedly. Well, I placed on my gamerson once. I need him to hold it back for me. The chief and Vither exchange confused looks, but then shrug and return to the matter at hand. I follow the wolf behind one of the screens. Rannock leads me quite a while without saying a word. Once we're far enough, I finally blurt out in half jest. So, you sure Kor is not into you? The wolf doesn't regard me. In fact, he increases his pace. And Cora said someone's going through our house. Oh, wait, what? I blink, coming to a stop. She couldn't say it in the open, so she needed a reason to whisper it to me. You mean all that groping was just for show? Fuck, why am I so easily riled up? Of course you wouldn't lie about not being into Rannoch. Why are we even focusing on this nonsense when I've just been told we were burgled? Did she know who it was? No, she didn't. And she's rather afraid to check. If they're bold enough to raid my house, who knows what they would do to her. Do you think it's the elders, one of their goons? Or well, might be. He shrugs worriedly, pacing in a small circle. Fuck, I've never heard of anything like this. Like what? Someone breaking into your home, it just doesn't happen. Really? I scoff in slight disbelief. It's not that they've set up here that... Said a few of little paradise lost. Yes, really. We're a tight knit community, I know. I sigh teasingly, looking at him with a gentle smile. I mean, there isn't anything in your house that's incriminating. I say with confidence, which slowly fades away. Is there? Well, there's no additional bed in for one. Could be that you make me sleep on the floor? It gives me a pretty condescending looks like I've said something stupid. What? Well, I'm not drawn. I have a reputation of a soft paw. A soft paw? A wolf is extremely lenient with his wards. Triss never slept rough. I pondered for a moment and snapped my fingers. I make up my bed in every day and put it away. I mean, why wouldn't I? The cottage is small. Well, I guess. 
He sounds unconvinced. My mind drifts to another matter entirely. There wasn't anything precious at the cottage, right? Like, you weren't robbed just now, were you? No, I have all my valuables on me, and you're here. So even the cottage burned down, nothing important would be lost. I smile involuntarily as he continues to betray his concern with me at every moment. Well then, nothing to worry about, right? Someone just came in, looked around for some dirt, and left with nothing. Hmm. You might as really upset by the whole debacle. Real strange to know someone was in your house while you were away, you know? I was at your house while you were away. I tease, but he doesn't take the bait. Uninvited, I mean. Sorry, I was trying to lighten the mood. Been through so much already, this is the last thing you need right now. I place a hand on his shoulder. I know what you mean. Makes you feel vulnerable and almost violated. Well, I bet it's all time was behind it. Father warned me they were stirring trouble. There have been quite a few others. I'm not about to say that out loud. He's got enough on his plate. We'll have to make a sweep of the ground once we head back. Mm-hmm. I'm not in the greens. We make our way back towards the grounds so I remember our excuse from the table. Wait, shouldn't you take a leak at least? What? Why? So they can smell you've actually done it? Well, don't be ridiculous. No one's going to be sniffing out for my piss. He snorts in bemusement. I simply shrug. As you say. The wolf notices my confusion, decides to indulge me. We have a keen sense of smell, true. That leads to information overload. Most of the time your mind blocks off unnecessary information. It's only when we focus on a scent where we can harness the detail. Huh. It sounds slightly confused and he laughs. Well, in other words, if you're not sniffing for something, or most importantly, don't know what you're sniffing for, you won't smell it. And now my brow at his obvious tone. How should I know how their senses work? I guess it's a good piece of information to hold on to. Considering I've just done the laundry, I don't think the intruder could smell anything of significance relating to me, so I sign relief. Once we arrive back at the table, the conversation about Regara's pack continues in earnest. I know his voice is listening intently, with a nail leaned over onto his shoulders, sleeping. It's actually quite cute how the black male seems to not mind her one bit. I wonder if she's faking it again. So how many walls in total did you get? With the other runs four? Eleven. Only three escaped. So he decimated two neighbouring packs. Tran pitches in with a scolding tone in his voice. Again, wouldn't have to do any decimate if they weren't here to begin with. The female states sternly and many nods in agreement, including Rano as we take our seats. Besides, she pauses the reluctant proceed, but the chief encourages her. What is it? I don't want to sound crazy, but there didn't seem to be packs at all. What do you mean? The male tilts his head in confusion. The female tries to collect her thoughts. They didn't have rangers with them, scouts, or any typical pack structure. Just regular warriors, some quite heavily armed. Heavily armed? Fully plated. In fact, the walking tin wolves seem to be a foreign extraction. A foreign extraction? What are you trying to say, girl? The pudgy elder throws in impatiently. They weren't Avalon wolves. Their language sounded funny. You mean to say that Vorkan brought in wolves from across the sea? She shrugs awkwardly. Again, not claimed to be an expert on the matter. That's what it looked to me. If Vorkan is making overtures towards the wolf and whore, this is indeed troubling. Or we'll explain his unadded use of diplomatic immunity. The chief scoffed in the direction of the crumpled piece of paper which lies where it landed. So he hired a group of mercenaries. What of it? Audrey sneers, crossing her arms and leaning back in her seat like a petulant child. What if those aren't just mercenaries? What if he brought their experts to train his wolves in the art of warfare? What is reorganising his tribe into a proper army? Are you suggesting our army's not proper? A female raises her voice, intentionally drawing attention from the neighbouring tables and stirring murmurs among the gathered. The stakes this size, not like others were ignoring the conversation up to this point, the little stunt made them pay attention twofold. The chief takes note of that and takes a deep breath, weighing his words carefully. I'm suggesting we've been following an outdated dogma that prevented progress. 
Our troops are more suited for guerrilla warfare, living in these woods alone. We don't stand a chance facing a regular army. Not like the ones walls fields across the sea. We stood against Tiger and we weren't even born. I lived through it. Audrey states proudly, pushing her sausage like fingers deep into her chest. The chief remained silent, taking a moment to stand up. Aye, I've heard that story many times, just as any other wolf did. All six tribes united. Tens of thousands of wolves lost to a single battle mage, with barely a handful of troops at his command. He takes a deep gulp from his chalice. It wasn't a war, it was a joke. Targaryen didn't even bother sending their real army. Our ancestors fought valiantly. A female snarls, stomping in anger, again trying to make a spectacle so everyone pays careful attention to what's being said. The feasting ground goes quiet like a graveyard. More than a hundred wolves seated and you can hear a pin drop. The chief takes another deep breath and smiles at the inciting female. Aye, they fought valiantly, they fought bravely, and the tigers made a picnic on their graves. If Orkin is mobilised, it means he's making plans much bigger than just a border skirmish. What's worse, it's not going to look mighty well in the capital. The Sorcerer King is not going to take lightly to one of our own treating with the Wolven Horde, just as their war was concluded. Little leans in, refilling his friend's cup. Those damned direwolves are trying to open the back door to Daguerre on use as their cannon fodder. You may dislike me all you like, Aldris. Even you must see where this is headed. We retained our sovereignty at the Sorcerer King's whim. We preserved it by blood and steel. She shouts out, but this time the chief had enough. At the Sorcerer King's whim! He roars, slamming his goblet against the table and sending wine cascading every which way. Everyone's frozen in place as his rattle of breath echoes across the ground. Dilvitha places the paw on his friend's shoulder and brings him down to his seat. He calmly replenishes Varrock's cup again and gives the old female an aggravated look. I just this pen struck away from losing everything we own. You do understand that, right? Of course she doesn't. She's never been outside of the moon damp forest. The chief sneers through his clenched teeth. Yes, but he was. With a nod to Dran. You've been yes, mom, and a drivel your entire life. Perhaps now it's time to grow a pair and speak some scent into that woman. Aldrich snarls at the brown male while Dran fidgets nervously. Here we are out there in the real world. Tell her where we feature on every map. Hi. The old male tries to gather his courage, but falters and the female gives him a penetrating look. But he's right. As far as everyone's concerned, we're a part of Targaryen. So you see, we're here and left our own devices because the tigers don't care. At first, it seems they're finally getting through to her. She listens intently to what the chief has to say. I need you to understand how important it is that they continue to not care. Because if we make them care, then everything your precious ancestors ever worked for, everything you ever claimed to strive for, will become undone within the blink of an eye. Here, the mercenaries or advisers, if Orgen invited wolves from Euron to his court, will be seen as an insult in the capital. For all a car was an illusion, but he simply waiting for another slip of the tongue to get hanged over. I see this time spent the tigers rubbed off on you. They call that Targaryen city in such a manner. It is the capital. Whether you like it or not, the heart of Avalon beats in Targaryen. The chief snorts if you're addressing a naive pup. I think seeing so, the Panthoria and Caria and the Felinians all publish pledge their allegiance to the alliance of Targaryen. Even the damned huskies and human yaldums cooperate with them. With the reinforcing the point, counting all the different species on his fingers. If Orc can start something foolish, we'll have the entire continent on our head. Yes, yes, not a first time I've heard a doomsayer spin his tail. As always, Aldris is not receptive. How does single tribe start a war with Tigeron? It wouldn't. The chief shrugs, catching him by surprise and drawing everyone's attention back to the exchange. Vorkin is smart, ambitious, and above all, patient. Now I like the kid, always been a grubby wolf. He's more of your persuasion. He nods to the pudgy female. Always struck me as a petty little schemer. But we ought to give credit where credit's due. You always got what he wanted, one way or another. Not like your friend over there and his father before him. Even their methods seem mighty similar. Aldous deflects and a slight gasp can be heard from among the gathered. 
Mr. Lux's friend with worry, the chief's lips curve up to reveal his fangs, but no outburst comes forth. Even Rannoch is clearly unsettled. It seems that the comment holds a deeper meaning that is completely lost on me. Be that as it may, it's clear that the throne of Calderon was not the end of Wardekin's ambitions. The brown wolf seizes the opportunity to return the conversation on track. He's for open our borders, he means he's getting ready to make his bid. A bid for what? For Tiernan. And not just our tribe, the entire damp forest, from Anwin all the way to Aradon. He states plainly, taking a shallow sip and drawing a few murmurs from surrounding tables. Aldous takes a careful look over the gathering and simply laughs it off. This is absurd! The Wolf and Horde just concluded a very costly and humiliating peace with the Emperor of Leoness, the Goldman Kingdom and the Alliance of Targaryen. Why are they waste their resources now on a backwater on the other side of the world? He poses a rhetorical question. When Aldous could not provide an answer, the Chief simply picks up for her. Indeed. They must have had assurances. The only thing enticing enough I could imagine is the unification of our people under their banner to create another front in their enemy's backyard. This is all nonsense. The pudgy female exhales in amusement, shaking her head. You two are drunk with power and high on epic tales of old. She speaks mockingly, using a stool almost like a stage or oratory skills. You talk to our brethren across the sea behind a worldwide conflict. Oh, I was the last one by the world war. With her proposing another question, this time with any levity in his voice. From the Zesses of Kemet through Persian and Rosmusavi, all the way to Ursa Highlands. They engulfed all three continents in their war, not once but three times over. That's just in the last century alone. He emphasizes with a slightly risen voice. If you act like a mad dog, you'll be treated like one. And I'm no brothers with savage beasts about to be put down. This so-called woven hordes managed to unite every single other kin in this world against them. They've given canines a bad name. The chief recounts. Not only this, they've abandoned Aluna herself. They burned down their sacred groves and turned to their perverse magics. He adds with no hidden disgust in his voice. Far what the other kin say about them is true. He pauses, clearly struggling to understand Aldrich's point of view. How is it their sudden involvement in our northern neighbour does not unsettle you? All this is just hearsay, based on the words of this pup. Aldous tries to sound confident, but its clearer composure is wavering. As usual when running out of argument, she resorts to the dumbest of insults. Regara is thrice her size, she's no pup. And the irony doesn't seem to be lost on Vithra and the chief. She's a daughter of the best smith this side of the woods. If she says they were foreign steel, I'm willing to bet my life on it. We're ready to convey a howl and pray it isn't too late. The chief weighs his paw dismissively, clearly losing patience with his quibbling. Dran. He addresses the old male with almost pleading expression. The first time I see the old wolf clearly torn and almost unsettled, casting nervous gazes between his defiant companion and the chief. Your only son is out there, fighting moon knows what odds. Surely you don't mean to leave his hardships unanswered. I, I would... He tries to muster the courage to speak, but the vile woman cuts him off. Dran knows his place in the tribe, and so does Delran. We're not swayed by petty sentiments like the two of you. To us, the good of the tribe is of paramount importance. Which tribe, I begin to wonder? With her mutters in a harsh, cold tone, taking a sip of wine while the female can barely collect herself. It doesn't take long for her to blow a gasket and start howling like the mad bitch she is. How dare you! I gave my entire life for our people! Unsuccessfully, obviously. Some tried much harder at your behest. The entire forest is filled with name trees of those who made the ultimate sacrifice. So you don't you dare go telling me what you gave up for the tribe! The brown male sneers of the chief has clearly had enough and once again waves his paw impatiently. I say we're getting nowhere here. I'll give you two a moment to discuss it amongst yourself, but come midnight we shall vote whether or not to invoke a howl. He raises from his seat and everyone gets up, apart from Vol, who tries to nudge Janelle for her sleep. Ah, oh, don't. Let her rest. The wreath won't fall from my head just because you're seated. Come, I want to talk with you. The old male looks back to my wolf and nods in the direction of the forest. 
Ronald calves me to my feet with the chief sneers in annoyance. Where's the damn monkey be? Nothing's going to happen to him in the span of just a few moments. The grey wolf looks at me as worry, but I shrug at him with a reassuring smile. I'm going to be just fine. Whatever's going on is much more important. With the chief and Ranok taking a leave, everyone slowly disperses. The grounds resemble what I've seen the first time around, with different wolves mingling and chatting. There's plenty to chat about, that's for sure. I take idle, idle sips of wine, discreetly paying attention to what's been said at the nearby tables. Everyone's very much on edge, and soon the war might be coming, but whom they'd fight seems as confusing to them as it is to me. The common theme seems to be a reluctance to openly battle with their own kin, though very few appear willing to forego transgressions committed by their northern neighbours. The elders also took notice of the conversations, decided to take rounds between the various tables, talking to the prominent tribes' wolves with the aim to most likely, likely sway their opinions. So in this commotion, Vitha disappeared, most likely to find his daughter and ensure she's out of harm's way, feeling at the spat with the elders. I really hate those old farts. Their behaviour leaves very little doubt about how rotten they truly are. And before long, I have another proof, almost as if the universe tried to mock me. Aldris, the fat bitch, begins storming towards our table, clearly stomping in my direction. She pushes the mug in my face, while poking a nail harshly in the shoulder, stirring the old female from another one of her naps. Do you intend to simply vegetate here? Maybe you join a discussion. It's so worded more like a demand than a suggestion. I frown. Being slightly to the sides, the cup is still very much in my face. Oh, I know. I think I've had enough excitement for one night. I'll just stay where I am, thank you. Oh, what well, was the point of being dragging you here? Audrey sneers and looks at me with anger. She pivots around the table and grabs my wrist, shaking me to and fro. Why are you damn moron? I haven't got all night. At first I'm startled. My anger finally kicks in and I decide there and then not to dance with tune ever again. I simply sit there, looking at her with a puzzled expression. I'm a dumb ape, after all. That human has all the makings of an idiot. My little gambit is about to turn sour as the female loses her patient, lifts her arm with a clear intent to hit me. I'll teach you some obedience. What are you doing? Regara arrives in the nick of time, granting both shock and anger and causing the elder female to reconsider. You would strike a guest at a dinner table? Her voice carries an oddly serious tone. Even Anel is quite surprised. Surely you wouldn't. The frail female adds in a worried tone. Why, violating hospitality rights is a serious crime. It may even make your father roll in his grave. He's not a guest! Aldrich protests through a growl. The tower of is not let up and moves in closes, square off with that vile woman. The chief declared him so, and as far as I'm aware, his word is the law. All oh, the damn bunnies are bolted, so how am I supposed to get a refill? As she says, I would cast my gaze around, and due to a statement there's no attendant to be seen in sight. I guess they've used the recess to talk amongst themselves. After all, the issue relates to them as much as it does to the wolves. You're not a cripple. Fetch your own damn wine. I managed just fine, and I've just returned from battle. With barely a scrape. Still more than you've ever experienced. Listen here, you overgrown bitch. Oh, fuck, I can't believe Granny's missing all of this. The black wolf throws in indifferently, taking a prolonged and very slurpy sip of his ale. Oh, you always love good gossip. Bring me up to speed about this circuit should prove entertaining. And again, as hero magic spell, the sheer mention of her sister causes Aldrich to fall silent, and the female fidgets uncomfortably. Oh, who would your grandma, pray tell? You, you look fine, mighty familiar. And Nell gives Vol a careful look, obviously she saw him for the first time. Oh, she's, oh, she's your friend, Anel. My friend? Oh, what joyous news! The frail female clasps her paws in pure bliss. I thought all my friends were long gone. Oh, fortunately, not all of them. Oh, it's just the shits that stick around and stink up the place. The comment clearly annoys Aldris. I can tell by a tightening grip on my arm and I groan in pain. This is going to leave another mark. If the monkey won't serve, pass me the bottle at the very least. The pudgy female throws demandingly at Vol and the wolf scoffs. Fuck no, I'm not your damn waiter. This is our wine. 
You can fetch your drink from the common tables. In rage, Aldris lets go of my arm and shoves it away, pointing his sausage like finger at the towering female. Now listen here and listen well. Or you can have my cup, dearie. And now interjects, offering the chalice to the nasty bitch in a shaky pause. Or should save you the trouble. Aldris feeds around the table and snatches the cup with a subdued growl, storming off and grumbling under her breath. Bunch of softwalls, infatuated, stunted mongrel. Oh, you're welcome. Frail female mutters, and I sigh heavily, really thankful to be surrounded with kind and assertive wolves to look out for me. I get up from my spot and go behind the pavilion. There, as I suspected, I find a side cupboard from which I fetch one of the clean cups. When I return to the table, I nod for the wine bottle, which is slightly out of my reach. Regara gives it to me with a smile. I fill up a replacement cup for Nell and pass it to her. She takes it with a gentle nod and a kind smile. But before she can say a thing, I can hear Aldrich's anger shouting from afar. Had it been a wolf, one had thought he'd doing it on purpose! The female snarls in my direction, and I snort discreetly, shrugging it off and returning to my spot. Now it's only us at the table, I can take a discreet glance at Tano, who's been quiet throughout the whole feast so far. Not sure if he's fuming over a surrendered seat or simply hatching another plan to torment me. He seems very focused and agitated. He's mostly playing with his knife, chiseling something nervously into the side of the table. He's only quiet for his usual self. My attention is quickly drawn to the overgrown female. Despite Anel snoffly snoozing again between them, Regara takes this opportunity to lean towards the black wolf. So, since I no longer have a mate, I guess this means I'm back on the market. Well, how about you and me, you handsome beast? Oh, our pups will be hulking monsters who could conquer the world. She winks at him, causing the male to fluster. Well, he's really cute when he can't handle his own flavour of advances. Oh, what an appealing perspective. He must uncomfortably and stands up, nudging Anel to rest herself against Regara's shoulder instead. I'm going to go and fetch Marissa. She'll be needed for the boat. And off he goes, bolting with the tail tucked between his legs, causing me to chuckle. What a coward. If you dish it out, you should be able to take it. I shake my head in amusement and simply continue nibbling on my dinner, washing it down from time to time with wine. In truth, I'd prefer this over the ale, especially since it's vintage, it's actually quite sweet. Almost like boozy grape juice. None of that vinegary taste at all, which I normally associate with wines. But my idle enjoyment quickly comes to an end, as with the black wolf gone, the white one sweeps into action. Or even though he's already on me, grabbing my hand and pulling me into my feet. Walk with me, now. He demands in a hushed tone as I try to object. Let go of me. I whisper, but seeing him withdraw in regards attention, I fall dead silent. What are you doing? The female looks towards the white wolf with doubt. Uh, nothing, I just need him to help me with... Uh, with... He struggles to come up with a lie and she gives him a knowing look. Tano, leave the human bee. I'm really no mood for your antics tonight. Why does everyone keep assuming I want to do something? Because you're a devious little git. Ranok saved my life, and he is very set on this little one. If you harm him in any way, I shall have to harm you in turn. The human and I are fine. The white will protest. The female throws a curious gaze to me and tilts her head. Obviously, if she's trying to figure something out. Unsettled, I simply poke Tano discreetly so he let go of me and the wolf complies. He raises his paws in defeat and gives Regara a dumb smile. See? Nothing underhanded here. Now, would you please? Tano then looks at me with a rather pleading expression and folds his hands in the direction where he means to lead me. I simply nod and we walk away from the table. They even puzzle Regara to tend to a knell. Through with the Ranok, Tano leads me into the woods, and we meander between the trees until the sound of the feasting ground is just a distant murmur. He finally stops and shoves me back a few steps, snarled on in his angered muzzle. Is your intention to get killed tonight? What? No. Then what the fuck are you doing antagonising her like that in the open? I wasn't antagonising anyone. I protest, but he simply sneezes at me with annoyance. I saw you fucking around with the knell to piss off Aldris. I wasn't fucking around, it was being nice and helpful. Oh, please. I've been playing this bullshit on others for far too long to not recognise it when others do it. 
The small wolf utters in a mocking tone, clearly hinged on his act in the previous feast. So you admit being nice to me only to piss off Rannock. I didn't deny you had some inclinations to that senile old she-wolf. He snorts in slight offence and I scoff. Does that say you have any towards me? I don't have any misgivings about you yet, but that credit of trust begins to wane pretty fast with the way you act. You know what? I'm not going to discuss trust and table manners with you. I roll my eyes in annoyance. He's the last one to preach me about either. Fucking little creep. In fact, now I think about it, I bet it was you who sent someone to ransack Ranok's house. Ranok's house? He blinks in immediate, immediate surprise. What are you talking about? Oh, please. I mimic his mannerism. Stop with the fucking games and get to the point. What do you want from us? I already told you. And I wouldn't have my associates come anywhere near that the wolf. Tano protests fervently, getting red with anger as if I threw boiling water at him. I have enough runic related drama to last me a lifetime. Was this weird animosity between you two? I don't have a feeling you've somehow redirected somebody onto me. Well, if that's what you feel, then you're ready to work on your perception. He grunts mockingly, leaning against one of the trees with his arms crossed. My issues with Ranak are my own. I don't entangle others in that web. Cora seems to think otherwise, and she claims to be your friend. Look, I'm not going to discuss my relationships with an outsider. The wolf barely contains a growl. My issues with Ranak have nothing to do with you. If I truly harboured any resentment based on my bad history with him, I'd have your head served to that idiot on a silver platter. Maybe. I shrug and convinced, yet slightly unsettled by his words. Or maybe he's playing a long game I'm yet to understand. Well, I can see why you think that. Distrust in me is the safest court of action. I very much recommend it. So you admit I shouldn't trust you? You shouldn't trust anyone, not even Rannoch. He sighs heavily, walking off a few steps. It's your odd trust in nature that keeps perpetuating this shit show. You like hearing the sound of your voice, don't you? As a matter of fact, I do. He snorts. Some would say it's my best quality. You mean your only quality? And now, now, who's the one being spiteful? The wolf smirks and I roll my eyes. Uh, if you don't understand why everyone dislikes you so much, you would drive a saint berserk. Why? Because I make valid points? Your points are as valid as likely are your bullshit stories. I sneer in annoyance, losing my patience for his dumb mind games. You haven't raided Rannock's house, then who did? I ask mockingly, though my conviction slowly falters, seeing his puzzled expression. What do you mean? Wait, are you saying that someone actually went through his house? His shock tells me he took it as first as a blind accusation, but now I have told him more than I should have. Scleedy picks up my sudden shift and he grabs my shoulder sternly. Tell me what happened. I shouldn't have said anything. Well, you've already said it. Did someone go through Rannock's house or not? I nod reluctantly. Not only it's too late to backtrack from it, but having him left lingering might have only lead to more of his nosiness. Seriously? He sounds almost as shocked as the revelation as Rannock was. You're the nosiest wolf in the village. Why so surprised? Because this is taking it a bit too far. Well, if it wasn't you, then I suppose it's the elders. Tano shakes his head, his brows narrowed in deep thought. No, they're rash, but not dumb. Breaking to another wolf's den is... Takes a deep breath, closing his eyes in defeat. This is serious. Well then, who would have done it? I don't know. I'm not sure if he's faking the concern if this really unsettles him, but as of now he's the best leader I could possibly have, so I decide to appeal to his ego. You're very nosy, and incredibly clever. Everyone keeps saying so. How dangerously perceptive Tani, Tano is. If you can't figure this out, what chance do I have? At first he looks at me with a raised brow, taken aback by my words. But as I finish my little pep talk, he gives me a smile filled with pity. A nice try. Fine. I sigh. If flattery will work, then how about taking you on your word? You said you want to keep me safe. Now's your chance to prove it. I don't feel safe in a raided house. 
The wolf takes a deep sigh and walks a few paces in one direction and the other. Maybe one of his pack members did it? He proposes, but doesn't sound too convinced. I couldn't help but notice that Tyron in particular doesn't like you. No, it's none of his wolves. I shake my head. Wolves told them off, and they took it quite seriously. Well, they're all actors here. You just happen to be the worst one. I doubt they were pretending, not with Vol. I give him a doubtful stare. Perhaps you're right. He shrugs, but quickly his expression turns out of actual concerns. He comes to a stop. That would leave Andalt. In which case, I would suggest you start sleeping with your shutters and doors locked. You wouldn't take Rannoch in his own house, would he? Honestly, kid, even before you arrived, I couldn't bet a copper coin on what Andalt would or wouldn't do. Tano sighs heavily. But that's insane. Just as insane as tackling your own alpha inside of his bedroom? He into my arm was to rest and I frown. The borders of sanity have been pushed quite a bit ever since you came here. Why would Andalt attack us? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. He mutters worriedly. Maybe his trees told him to, or maybe he had another of his crazy visions. He's always been touched. There was no rhyme or reason to what he did, now more so than ever. My heart sinks a little and I feel cold sweat dot my body. This revelation unnerves me, more so since I don't know anything about this Andal guy. Why am I learning about him being a problem just now? I guess Rannick and the others don't treat him as much as a threat. I see he's a bit unhinged, why would they? If you try anything, I doubt he could best Rannick in combat. Oh, I quite agree. Tano nods casually, throwing me off. Not many wolves would stand a chance against your guardian. But you, you're a different matter entirely. He lets his words hang a bit, biting his lower lip. All it takes is a well-placed stab. Doesn't even have to be a deep one. He pokes various parts of my body, throwing the abdomen, moving on the chest and finally the throat. A simple poke here, or here, and especially here. The white wolf traces a line across my neck with his dull claw and I shudder. So many places to choose from. Just a split second should you're done for, long before your wolf could even react. You're doing it on purpose, freaking me out and deflecting my attention to another. You're the one who asked for my help. I saw Arnold taking vigil at Rannoch's house the very same night Vol had to save you from Tyron and Dre. You been there? I blurred out in shock, causing the wolf to laugh. And guess who else had been there as well, hiding in the bushes on the other side? I followed him there. That's why my senses went haywire. There are at least five wolves hidden in the shrubbery. I noticed my consternation and smiles, condescendingly patted my shoulder. As I said, you looked at the obvious threats like Aldris and a chubby fuck buddy, while staying completely oblivious to the most lethal one closing in on you from the day you arrived. Fuck. I hope this proves my current lack of ill will towards you. I want to talk back to his snide remark, whereas it would lead to nothing good. And he proved quite useful at the moment. I think we've been away for long enough. We tarry some more and Rannick will launch another rescue mission. I laugh involuntarily at his jab at the Grey Wolf's overprotectiveness, causing me to look at him with double suspicion. He seems quite dismissive of the elders as well. I really can't figure this guy out. It's incredibly frustrating. No wonder others dislike him so much. I'm going to make sure that all this isn't some elaborate lie. Because I don't care enough about you to lie, let alone make it elaborate. Wolf states matter-of-factly through a chuckle. I don't buy it. Is it my interest in me for that to be true? Oh, I shouldn't have been interested. You're the biggest novelty of our generation. He laughed, shaking his head in disbelief. So you do care. Have you ever seen an eclipse? He proses idly and I decide to indulge him. I guess so. Fascinating, rare phenomena, isn't it? When it's there, all you can do is stare, trying to understand the mystery behind it. But once it's gone, your life continues like it never happened. He gives me a condescending smile before his expression turns blank. Curiosity and caring are two different things. Don't confuse them. What is your end game here? Like, for real? I know it's hard for you to believe it, but I told you the truth. I want you out of trouble for the sake of the tribe. 
He looks at me with a solemn expression. Didn't you speak our language so fluently? More so than some of the wolves, I know. You understand well enough how pressing my people's situation is. You've been saying that before Regar has returned. I narrow my brows. His concern had emerged now to this brief one to make perfect sense. He acted concerned long before, almost as if he knew something was amiss. His tail swishes and he gives me a satisfied smirk. I see cogs begin to turn. Perhaps you're not a lost cause, after all. The white wolf pats my back as we arrive at the feasting ground and walks off. It's nice to know you're not just an eloquent cheap toy. Makes things that more interesting. He keeps fucking with me, the little prick. As much as he thinks he's smart, his ego does half of his talking. Just admitted he knew something was going on, something completely unrelated to me. I get a deep sigh and decide that I let go for now. It appears we returned in the nick of time. The chief and Ranak walk up the platform back from their private conversation. Even the bunnies are back, serving refreshments between the tables. The grey wolf casts his curious gaze between Tano, who has just taken his seat, and me as I barely approach the table. His muscle betrays he's suspecting something, and I sigh internally, knowing how to make up another lame excuse. I put my hand discreetly on his knee to reassure him. To my surprise, it works. He smiles lovingly at me and turns his attention to the bonfire where Vul can be spotted returning with Arissa. Once they take their respective seats, the chief grabs his goblet and begins to use it as a gavel again, banging onto the table in a bid to grab everyone's attention. Oh, settle down, please, settle down. He calls out, putting an end to the casual conversations and mingling. Give some time for the wolves to bolt back to their tables, more so since Aldris and Drana are incredibly unwilling to end their plotting. Once they're seated in their downsized stools, he glances over the empty spot beside him. Oh, where's Vitha? Yes, quietly in the direction of Vulnergara. The wolves only shrug. Vitha, where the hell are you? His call echoes across the ground and a paw raises from the far off table. Here, yeah, just give me a moment. The brown wolf responds as he gets up to his feet. He rushes towards us at a brisk pace, quickly taking his spot to his friend's left side. Oh, last minute negotiating. He leans to Varrock's ear and mumbles loud enough for me to hear. Good. Did Volgo give you a rundown of what we discussed so far? The chief addresses the white female and she nods while pouring herself a glass of wine. Yes, although I've got the first poor account from the wounded. How are they doing? Uh, Fryn lost a lot of blood but should pull through. And there is in no immediate danger or her left arm is shattered like a piece of glass. She states heavily, taking a deep, deep gulp. I did what I could to set the bones, but I can't make any promises beyond that. I've sent for Andals. I need an extra pair of paws, but no one has seen him in two days. As much as I feel sorry for the two wounded wolves, my attention drifts immediately to the main suspect of our home invasion. Uh, that damn lunatic is probably hidden in the forest caves. It'd be more of a hindrance to you and the aid. The chief scoffs dismissively and then faces the ground. So you all listen to Agara's account. I'm sure none here can question her integrity. Most of the wolves nod their heads and pat the tables in agreement. You've had the time to consider our situation away whether it warrants the attention of the Howl. I know we haven't convened one in nearly ten years, so I do not take this issue lightly. It's my firm belief that current events call for decisive action. Again the wolves pat their tables, this time with more zeal and energy. I uh, hear, yeah, hear. Yeah. So anyone thinks we should convene a howl, make their voice heard. Pretty much all the gathered howled and growled, clanging their cups against the wooden tables in unison. It was a resounding cacophony of support for the notion. And it was opposed the idea, let it be known. Now only a few voices echo across the field, scattered between the far-off tables, drawing this approving gaze of the majority. Well, there you have it. Chief looks towards Aldrich, who sits on his stool with her arms crossed and the resting bitch-faced expression. See, no matter who you spin is, our people consider what transpired as an urgent matter. All that's left is for us to take an official vote. Oh, Rannoch? He asks his son without breaking eye contact with a nasty female. Oh, I vote in favour. Well, go. Aye. Ragara? On my honour, aye. The chief turns towards the white wolf with slight reluctance, seeing as the male barely pays any attention to what's going on. Tano? Aye. The wolf responds to everyone's surprise, causing Aldrich to utter a hushed growl. 
A little pet project can see no reason why the stakes are high enough. The brown male smokes with satisfaction while the chief turns towards the shaman. Larissa? Aye, the wounded demand justice. The old wolf nods in satisfaction. Obviously with Dalron missing, his voice cannot be heard unless his father wants to speak for him. He turns everyone's attention to Aldrich's shadow and the male fidgets uncomfortably. Just as much as he's easy, as easy with the question, Aldrich's muzzle beams with joy she grabs her friend's shoulder and yanks it enthusiastically. Dran, this is your chance to end this madness and veto this farce. I will not betray my son's confidence even if I disagree with him. Dran yanks his arm free. Everyone looks at the male with eyes wide open. Even Aldrich is taken aback. Seeing Dran stand up to him must be a rare sight indeed. No, not we know. Had the situation been reversed and it was a Gara missing out there, Dalran would have voted to summon a howl. Do you wish to vote for him then? Forfeit in your elder's voice? The chief asks with a tone so filled with confusion that most looks between each other to ascertain they've heard it right. Aye. If you don't have the courage to do what needs to be, then abstain, you damn fool! Aldrich snaps in anger, getting up to her feet. She stands over the male and he slumps in defeat. Uh, I've stayed in both capacities. I'm a bit confused she's allowed to intimidate someone else's vote, but I guess different rules govern their society. With Dran being effectively silenced, the chief nods calmly, almost as if it didn't really matter. Perhaps he takes solace in the fact that there's a wedge forming between those two cunts. Well, there only is one elder to assent to this vote. You will never have my support in this matter. The pudgy female snarls, shaking her fist in the air if it were a serious threat. I don't want it. The chief shrugs. He brought all the support I needed. And now? He looks at the ancient female, and since she's again asleep, full has to nudge her. Oh, uh, yes, my chief. She mutters sleepily. This time I have a hard time telling if she was faking it or not. Oh, we just voted to summon the howl. All we need is an elder's assent. Her voice shouldn't count. She is senile. Again, Aldrich's harrowing screech and booms across the field, and Nell shivers uncomfortably. Oh, I don't know. I haven't partaken in such important matters in quite some time. Exactly, abstain, woman! The pudgy female continues her verbal harassment. Leave this matter, wolves, whose minds are still clear. Oh, now, we're at an impasse here. The chief speaks calmly, looking to her with a gentle expression. I won't ask you otherwise, but it's crucial we make a decision tonight. For the tribe. Oh, well, I've known you ever since you were a pup, Farrock. She gives him a kind smile. You've always put the need of our tribe above your very own. If you think this is what's best, then of course you have my support. Oh, thank you. He nods, issuing a sigh of relief. As always, you're a credit to our people. Whether I trust you to send the messages first thing in the morning. He turns to his friend and the brown male nods in agreement. Would you mind hosting her overnight? We'll need to see on every parchment. Not at all. We'll have some good old story time at the fireplace. With her laughs and winks towards the knell. Ooh, goody, goody. I'll have you some mulled wine. The one you like so much. Oh, that will be splendid. The female clasps her hands in joy, her expression brightening on the spot. I could also catch up with that lovely girl of yours. She's an unsupportable bitch. Oris growls again, causing the elderly female to blink in shock. Oh, goodness, that's not a word one often hears amongst the gentry. Mark my words, Varak, this will not play out the way you hope it will. The pudgy female issues a warning, turning her hateful gaze towards Anel. As for you, this is the last time I involved you in anything. Oh, do you promise? She asked politely, drawing a surprised chuckle from the gathered. Not sound ungrateful, dearie, but all this hassle is not good for a wolf my age. I very much like to be left undisturbed. No one within this tribe disturbs peace more than you. The chief bows his head respectfully to Nunel, while the pudgy female's growls intensify. She almost sounds like a chainsaw. For a moment everyone expects another outburst from the belligerent bitch, but seeing that pretty much all the eyes are on her, Aldris decides to storm off. She's taking her leave. She serves Dran off his stool into the dirt. What you did today took some courage. With a bops his cup towards the scrambling male, watching him slowly get back to his feet. 
That's no battle courage, but courage nonetheless. I don't need your pity. Duran sneers, looking at the chief with a mix of anger and desperation in his eyes. He honestly believes it's as serious as all that. At least send someone to get my son back. You have my word. The chief nods. I already decided a pack would leave tomorrow. Tano, get your wolves ready. And me? The white wolf nearly spits out his wine in panic. Yes, you. You're the second fastest after Rannoch. Your pack's in mostly rangers. Fither pitches in. If any more scouts in our woods, you may to fuck them in their asses. They gathered, laugh, and raised their cup to toast their proposed scenario. Also, I'll be sending my son to Strandbar tomorrow. The chief reveals, and this takes me by surprise. I cast my worried gaze to Oranok, poking his side to draw his attention. The wolf only puts a finger to his muzzle, asking that I remain quiet and returns to face his father. I'll treat him my name with a tick airy magistrate. We'll need good quality steel and supplies should things escalate. Do you think it's a good idea? Perhaps I should go. No, I need you here. Besides, if, he ever to come, if he's ever to become chief, he needs to learn. Father, with your permission, I'd like to take my attendant with me. He sees the opportunity. I want to both exhale in relief as much as leap with joy the prospect of travel. A human? Whatever for? Well, his memory might be blank as of the moment. That doesn't mean no one remembers him. Ronak states confidently. Perhaps in Strandbard a clue as to his origin would present itself. Hmm, I don't see why not. The chief shrugs. As long as he won't slow you down. Oh, he won't. In fact, he could carry some of the load, easing the journey significantly. All this nasty business suddenly takes a second seat there to visit in the tiger town. My mind begins racing with the mansions of that place. Very anyway, well, I guess that's all for tonight. We all have a busy morning ahead of us, so I suggest we call it a day. Just before he leaves the table, the chief stops and rummages behind a fold of his kilt. He retrieves something akin to a decorative stamp and throws it to Vitha. Save you the trip to the villa for my seal. You know what to do with it. Indeed. The brown wolf smiles. It seemed the chief wasn't joking when he said Vitha does half his ruling for him. He clearly trusts him enough to give him his seal. Then again, those two are incredibly close. close. With the chief taking his leave, the remaining wolves begin to disperse slowly. We stay at the table a few more minutes, with the alphas finishing up their drinks and meals. Fool is desperately trying to grab Varissa's attention, despite Regara being seated between them. Every time he tries to do anything, he never really draws the attention of the towering female, who mistakes herself as the target of his glances, keeps sending him flirtatious winks in turn. Not gonna lie, I enjoy watching Vol getting flustered like that. You seem duller and more benused than usual. I wake up Tano's hushed comment towards the white female. And here I thought it would be the first night where you keep your mouth shut. You're also touchier than usual. Mind your own damn business. Rissa rolls her eyes in annoyance. I was only asking, but I guess you don't want my help. I want you to shut up. I can clearly see she's upset and very much not interested in participating in any of the conversations. I notice some of her fur, along with parts of the dress, are covered with dried blood splotches. Patching people up after battle must be a horrible experience, that's for sure. Before I dis- dismiss her sound move the unpleasantness of her occupation, I notice the very same old rusty blade at her side. It's also covered in reddish residue. It's clear she washed it in haste, most likely rushing here for the vote. Can't imagine forming any sort of surgery with that thing. It's almost like operating on someone with a dinner knife. I shudder. Imagine being stabbed with that thing instead of Wolf's dagger. Though an unpleasant experience, his knife did go in effortlessly. In fact, the stab itself wasn't half as bad. It's what came after. I shake my head. Why do you buy her a fucking dress? A sharper blade would seem much more better a gift. So I finish my musing, so does everyone finish their meals. Regara downs her last cup of wine. She should have gone through at least a dozen by this point. There's no sign of her getting tipsy. Well, this was fun. Will you take me to my walls, will you? I will have to sleep a wink if I don't see them before I hit the hay. Oh, of course. The white female nods and walks over. Seeing this full empties the remnants of Everclee from the clay bottle and gets up. Oh, no. Oh, I say, you look. Please, well, don't. Uh, not tonight. 
she utters in resignation. I was covered in the blood of our friends. The last thing I need are your tortured advances. If you ever get tired of rejection, you know where to find me, handsome. Regara chuckles. I know you're a first-timer. I'll be gentle. Try not to break anything you might need later. She shoots at the burst of laughter and follows behind the white female, even wool in the proverbial dust. It take long for the black male to check out as well. Well, let's go home now. With the mutters between idle, licks his fingers. He gets up and throws away a chicken bone he just cleaned. Oh, uh, yes, let me get. Nell struggles to get up and I rush to her side to aid her. Oh, gallant as always. I'm getting quite attached to that funny fella. Hey, ain't that bad. The brown male comes to a stop in front of us and gently pushes me aside. I'll take over. Oh, just a moment, love. And Nell corrects Rannock's cape on her shoulders and looks towards the grey wolf. You'll be wanting this back. Oh, no, keep it. It's a chilly evening. My wolf has it through a soft smile as he approaches us. Aren't you just a peach? I'll have Ivy return it to you on the morrow. I'll see you later, little rascal. The ancient female ruffles my hair and allows Vitha to lead her away. Was well, there some distance between us? I mutter quietly. Who's Ivy? Oh, she's a Nell's attendant, a she bunny almost as ancient as Nell herself. I thought you only took young ones for indentured service. I looked at him in confusion. We do. I was with Nell since they were both our age. Jesus, how big was her debt? I nearly exclaimed, causing the wolf to laugh. Oh, that debt is long paid. I would decide to stay with a Nell of her own volition. At this point, they're more like friends than anything else. The way wolves are treated around you, I'm a bit surprised to hear that. Well, not all wolves are like Gran and Aldris. Being a ward isn't a punishment. It's just a natural order of things. The strong are meant to protect the weak, and in turn the weak serve the strong. Ward and Ward's relationship is meant to be built on mutual respect and care. It's just as some choose to abuse this. You say that, but I don't think other wolves see it that way. Well, maybe. It's just something Anel had taught me when I was young. Oh? Asking Rannock fidgets uncomfortably. I, I lost my temper with the Ward when I was a brash teen. I didn't strike him, but... Sometimes the things we say hurt just as much. His voice conveys evident shame and regret. She overheard me and gave me a lesson in humility. That explains it then. You had at least one good role model when it comes to the relationship with wards. Hey, no, my father doesn't abuse the bunnies. He sounds pretty defensive and I chuckle. True, but he doesn't befriend them either. The wolf smiles reluctantly, where his gaze ventures to the white wolf who's still sitting at the table. I need to give me a moment. I have to talk with him. Rannock, nothing happened. We just walked in the same direction. Now that you say it, I know it's not, exa- not exactly true. He gives me a knowing look. Right, I trust you. I have other business with him anyway. He's still one of us, and since my father is sending him out there, I want to brief him what I've seen. Uh, okay, good. Be nice to him. I say pleadingly. I know he can be an annoying dick, but he seems more confused than malicious. Huh. Rannock snorts in amusement, shaking his head. You are either a soothsayer or simply lucky with your observations. He continues to chuckle as he approaches the white wolf. I, on the other hand, am left alone, watches the remaining stragglers slowly leave the grounds. My gaze darts from time to time towards Wool, who simply walk between the tables, checking if there's any moonshine left in the clay bottles. Whenever he finds me, he simply downs it in one go, instantly searching for his next score. I sigh and decide to approach him. I know it might be my place to say this. I don't say it. But I'm not going to say it anyway. He grumbles, taking another sip of the Everclear. I think you're going about it the wrong way. What do I have to do to make you mind your own damn business, piglet? The black wolf throws me a languid stare. Stamming was not enough. Choking is not enough. Do I really need to kill you for you to fuck off? I sigh heavily, rolling my eyes as he's again in one of those moods. I have an idea of something you could do. Listen. He stops dead in his tracks, pulling me close and bringing his snarling muzzle right to my ear. I might enjoy you as one would enjoy a stray dog. If you continue barking, I won't hesitate to strangle you until I pop your voice box like an overripe plum. 
I didn't vent, his strained huffs of air brushing against my cheek and neck to no effect. Once he calmed enough, increases the distance between us, I continue. You're drunk, I'll come back to this another. How is it everyone keeps figuring out you can speak our language? It seems like you don't understand a fucking word I'm saying. He growls, smashing a clay bottle onto the ground and storming off. Fuck this noise. A few remaining wolves look in my direction, but quickly shrug it off as a dumb ward annoying the most volatile of wolves. Guess in such a light there isn't much to see. I look back to Rarok, worried you might have seen this spat, and to no surprise he did. This conversation with Tanner seems to take priority. I give them some more time, deciding around the dying at bonfire. Eventually their exchange is concluded and Rarok comes to fetch me. What was that about? Oh, nothing. Wool being wool as always. I sigh in resignation. Or oh, you being you? He teases reluctantly and I chuckle. That too. Oh, come, let's head home. The first leg of our walk back happens in complete silence, mostly on the count of small groups of wolves hanging around the entries of different houses. I can hear them discussing the events of the border, so we pass them by each group nods respectfully to Rannoch. They seem to approve and me admire his valour. It makes me proud to walk beside him. Instead of enjoying this well-deserved recognition, Ronak feels rather defeated. I can't have a notice his tail is slightly tucked in, and his ears aren't exactly upright. I have my suspicion confirmed when we enter the last stretch of the road, leading to the cottage. We had no soul around could speak freely, but Ronak remained silent. I can see something's troubling him, but decide to allow him a few moments to collect his thoughts. If he continues shutting down once we get home, then I'll try and prod. Right, you go inside and set up some fire. I need to check on the surrounding for any disturbances. I want to help. No, he says sternly. You would only confuse my senses and possibly disturb any clues. I look at him with worry, but the wolf doesn't budge. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. You are the other paw. Okay, I'll leave you to it. I concede and enter the cabin, hang up my cloak and approach in the stove in order to step a fire. Once the flames dance merrily, I bring two mugs of ale to the table, but otherwise don't move much, treating the place like a crime scene. I rest myself comfortably against the table and lock my gaze with the cracked in fire. I'm startled a little when I hear the window thud behind me, only see the shutters close. Ronox instinctively doing what Tano has suggested. I'm not sure how I feel about this whole situation. Once I hear the third set of shutters close, the wolf finally returns with a rather defeated expression. And? Oh, nothing. The wolf sighs and annoys, taking off his pauldron. He drops various parts of his gear despondently. Even his sword falls to the ground with a loud thud to the wolf's indifferent shrug. We'll need to lock them from the inside. There's a latch that bolts them into the sill. He points towards the windows, and I nod in understanding, opening each one and securing it. When I do so, Rannoch starts sniffing about, both literally and figuratively, reaching up high with his nose and then low to the ground, almost haunching like a beast. I watch as he scans the kitchen with his gaze, his nose twitching in search of any sign of disturbance. The wolf steps carefully into the bedroom to do the same, quickly returns slightly confused. All I can smell is lavender. I narrow my brows and take a deep inhale. Now that you mention it, so can I. My soap isn't this strong, though. Rannoch shakes his head. No, it's dried florets. Someone using the master's scent. I can't recognise who's been here. The wolf responds through a soft growl and I place my carving hand onto his shoulder. I mean, everything seems in place. I didn't touch anything either. He exhales in partial relief. Otherwise, I'd smell the perfumed residue. Seems that whoever was here didn't do much at all. Maybe it's just meant as a scare, whatever the reason. I look at the weary wolf with worry. Well, then, perhaps it was nothing. I pose with a hopeful tone. Maybe he's always just checking if you're in. Why lavender, though? He looks me with his green eyes, focused and determined. But a bit odd someone entered a home smelling like your newly acquired toiletry. When you put it like that... I might have rubbing my neck awkwardly. I definitely pan out with somebody creepily stalking me. And considering what Tyler had told me, Adolf fits the bill perfectly. The moment I actually want to talk about this with Ranlock, but seeing his troubled expression reminded myself of what was being said at the feast. 
so I can't bring myself to trouble him further. Anil seems harmless by everyone's account, a bit unhinged but otherwise manageable. I'd far rather focus on alleviating whatever troubles my wolf right now than worry about some mishaps with a slightly confused wolf. When Ronak plops resigned into his chair, decides it's time to lift up the mood. He's been acting off for a while now. Do you know what? It doesn't matter. I shake my head. For all we know, it's a stupid prank or a misunderstanding. Let's focus on Huron now. I grab one tangle and push it towards him, seating myself comfortably opposite the deflated wolf and taking a sip. Despite my efforts, Ronak seems as defeated as before. It doesn't seem to be related to the house intrusion either. He's been all over the place ever since he came home. No mood quickly turned. I muttered casually, trying not to sound too pushy. I thought you'd be excited about tomorrow. I know I am. Imagine the famous Strandbard. I mean, you don't have to imagine it. You've been there. I chuckled, shaking my head at my poor choice of words. I kept wondering how it all looks. Not to mention meeting a tiger. How do you say Kin? A folk, actually. He responds indifferently. So, tiger folk? He nods. Kin is more appropriate if you refer to your own kind, although most use it in colloquial speech. Tigers are a bit mm, stuck up on the matter. So, you're not a wolfkin then? Well, I am to my own kind. To you, I'm a wolven folk. That can't be right. I narrow my brow in confusion. What's the singular form of folk, fellow? I snort in amusement. He looks at me with a puzzled expression. Wolf fellow sounds ridiculous. I think I'll stick to Wolfkin. How about you stick to just Rannoch? He teases and finally takes up his mug. Seeing his smile waver again, it becomes clear I need to be more direct. What did your father want, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, not at all. He shakes his head. He told me about the things we need to secure from Strandbard. Steel, potions, salves, along with provisions. What sort of provisions? Oh, foodstuffs, non-perishables. He sighs, taking a deep gulp of ale. As you heard, we had a few harsh winters in a row. Our stockpiles are running low. You don't seem to be doing that bad, considering the buckling tables of the feasts. Well, it's not like that. We have the food, but there's a war coming, we might need grain. Some of you don't grow in large quantities. Seems straightforward, then. I muse, looking at him intently. His expression isn't changing even one bit. Was there anything else you discussed? No, that's pretty much it. He shrugs and I sigh heavily. He's not going to tell me unless I force him to. Then why the long face? You seem fine at the feast, and now not so much. Well, I was happy to see you. He states plainly, drilling his sad green eyes into me. And you've taken me by surprise. For a moment. The wolf chuckles, rubbing his forehead as if he was scolding himself. For a brief moment, I've got everything that happened. You mean the battle? Yeah. His voice is completely devoid of any humour and I swallow heavily. What Regara described sounded horrible. I haven't seen half of what she has seen. It's still... He struggled to speak, clenching his eyes and teeth. I get up to my feet and walk towards him, placing a hand on his shoulder. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, I don't know. I can feel him contract, almost as if he cringed at the sheer idea of opening up. The feast, despite what sounded pretty messed up and cruel, they kept the mask of levity. I mean, they are a society of warriors, I suppose they appear soft is scoffed at. Shh, it's okay. I mutter as he shudders. We don't have to talk about it if you'd rather not. Just know that I am here for you. At first he seems to continue to shut me off. After just a moment of silence, he turns to me reluctantly and sighs. I wouldn't even know where to start. You can start in your own time, at your own pace. I try to sound reassuring, ruffling his shoulder fluff. You can start by telling me in your own words what really happened out there. No crowds to appease or elders to impress. Just you and me. I smile, looking into his worried eyes with love and care. First he smiles back, then the wolf takes a deep breath and gets up to his feet in sluggish fashion. I watch as he walks over the cupboard and retrieves the flag in the moonshine. His fangs grip the cork and he unplugs the bottle on his way back to the table. I want to fetch him a clean cup. The wolf simply sits heavily into the chair and empties his remaining ale in one go. Once done, Rannoch pours himself some Everclear, 
only to bob the bottle inquisitively in my direction. No, thanks, I'm fine. I muttered, which only shrugs and downs the contents in one thirsty gulp. The wolf takes a deep breath and lowers his head, locking his tired gaze with the floor, and feel his body tensing. When I arrived there, I heard screaming. No, not screaming. Battle cries drowned out only by the ringing of steel. Once I finally cleared the ridge obscuring my view, I couldn't understand what was happening. My sister back was beset by wolves I've never seen in my life. Or our kin. And they were enraged. He shakes his head, looking at me with deep sadness in his eyes. This was no ordinary battle. I could see that my friends were worn down and the enemy was frothing at the mouth, almost like wild beasts eager to score a kill. It took me a moment to take it all in. That's when two of the nearest wolves noticed me. They disengaged and looked at me as confused as I looked at them. All of it melted away, replaced by hateful snarls. Everything went quiet as I stood frozen, seeing them rush in my direction. He paused as to take a deep breath if he felt ashamed. I fear death. Not death itself, actually, but... I feared for my unfinished business with those left behind should I fall. I feared for what would happen to you should I not return. In that split second, I realised this wasn't only about them and me. I was there to make sure I get my friends safely home, so that I can get back to you. Again his green eyes lock with mine, I take hold of his paw, squeezing it slightly. It was two lives against the many, and that thought allowed my instincts to take over. The first one thought he was fast enough to lunge at me. He wasn't. He chuckles nervously, clearly trying to hide how unsettled he really is. I smile back at him softly. I parried, and before he even realised, his head was already sliding off his shoulders. The whites of his hateful eyes trembling in shock as it dawned on him that he was done. The second wolf hesitated, seeing his friend decapitated with a single blow, which allowed me to rush him and push my blade right through his chest. Again, I looked into the enemy's eyes. I don't think he expected to die. The disbelief taking over his muzzle startled me, so I thrust deeper to ensure he did. I swallow heavily, still squeezing his hand in support. He gurgled blood, spitting some onto me, and finally his legs went soft. I, I don't know why, but I grabbed him close. He wouldn't fall. Laid him gently on the ground and shared his final moments. He, he took two more rattle breath, with his poor shaking in final tremors. I grabbed it and held it firmly, almost as if to give him courage to slip in at the eternal dark. Because you're a good wolf, no one deserves to die alone. I interject, lit up his chin and making his glossy eyes meet with mine. Maybe. Or maybe I did it to avoid feeling guilt. He shrugs, rubbing his eyes and looking away towards the window. In any case, that's when Agara's rallying cry pulled me out of my stupor. The sound of battle raging all around me returned and I got back to my feet. After that, everything was a blur. My mind was racing and everything happened so fast. But by the end, all but three of the strangers were dead. He reaches up for the flag and pours himself another generous portion of moonshine. At first I want to protest, ask him to go slower at it. I quickly realised it wouldn't be fair. Not after what he told me. So I let him down the cup hole. Instead of preaching at him, I simply listen. It takes him a moment or two to compose himself, but soon enough he continues. Regara wanted to pursue and I think we would have. We would have hunted those wolves they were feral rabbits. He sneers, bearing his fine, clear anger. When a heart pumps but as hard as mine did then, you don't think, you just do. Of course. I nod. He did what had to be done. 
I had to. The surprised gaze meets with mine, I'm taken aback. Did I accidentally make another slip of a tongue? We didn't have to do anything had those wolves not been there. In fact, even their trespass, there was no need for any of this. They wanted Ragara dead, her entire pack. Why? I, I don't know. I mutter in a saddened tone. I can see this is tearing at him. How did it come to this? What makes one become so cruel towards a complete stranger? To wish him dead, by your own paws nonetheless. His heavy voice makes my heart sink and I feel slightly choked up. Let a moment of silence overtake us, I absorb all he has said. Do you remember the tiger noble we talked about? Please. He must have pleaded in the air, looking with worry. You want to rub that in my face now? I understand that you're hurting. I spawn softly, but still conveying slight offence in my tone. I think I would have brought it up just to have another jab at you. I just want to make a point to help you wrap your head around this crazy situation. Wolf looks at me with worry, eventually nods in resignation, allowing me to continue. Your people executed that tiger, not because they hated him, or because the tiger was evil. Your people did because they believed he had done something unforgivable. When people believe things strongly, they can sometimes take that belief too far. He listens carefully, although his entire posture is getting more deflated. I don't know what those wolves from up north believe. They leave it strong enough to put swords in their paws and march right into your territory. They believe killing you is the right thing to do. I don't know where I come from, but I know this. Bullies never stop. When I heard of the feast, those wolves will continue believing they have the right to harass and attack you unless proven otherwise. You had no choice. It was you or them. I finally draw his attention and muster a loving smile to encourage the defeated wolf. And I, for one, am glad it was them. I killed two people. He mutters in protest. I know what you think. They were wolves. That's why it bothers me. He sounds accusatory, throwing his hurt gaze to the side. Wolves or not, I don't care. Be they rabbits or humans or even damn tigers, it doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I took two lives. It's not what I think at all. I know you're not like that. He looks at me with his glossy eyes, barely containing the tears. One moment they were there, and the next, they weren't. I sent two beings into the eternal dark. You were defending your friends. I replied almost automatically. I've never killed before. In the heat of the battle I wasn't thinking about it. But once it was all done, once I saw the dead bodies on the ground... He shivers slightly and the two drops finally trail down his cheeks. I don't know what to say. I embrace him tightly. I am to simply let his emotions flow. For a while nothing happens. But as the time passes, the tremors rock in his body intensify. And finally his heavy breathing breaks into a subdued weep. They're just kids. All of them. Despite their tough looking exterior, they're really just kids. Like me or any other people living normal lives. They might have spent their childhoods playing with weapons and training to fight, but at the end of the day, wielding them in actual combat is another thing entirely. I can't say I know how you feel. I might have softly but loud enough so he could hear me over his own sobbing. I can't really imagine it. It must be a horrible burden to carry at such a young age. But just because you killed someone doesn't make you a killer. I try to reassert it, contradicting the fear that clearly has taken hold of him. Seeing you have such an adverse reaction proves beyond a shadow of a doubt the opposite. His rattled breath begins to subside as he tries to listen to what I say. Your friends were fighting for their lives. It's a matter of choosing between them or strangers who wish them harm. It's a choice most would make without a second thought. Protect others regardless of personal cost. In fact, it's a choice you made in this very house. And not towards the bedroom door. Right there, when your father wanted to execute me. You're almost naked, yet you showed such ferocity. It took two armed guards to restrain you. 
You're very protective of those around you. That's a good thing. I try to sound encouraging, rubbing his cheek fluff of moisture as he locks his shaky gaze with mine. It means you're willing to go to great lengths to keep your loved ones safe. I hope that when the time comes and my own resolve is tested, I do the same. He takes a deep sigh and without a word pulls me into a deep kiss. His warm tongue slips between my trembling lips and I seize up, feathering out my fingers in surprise and suddenly everything goes silent. No crickets outside, no rustle of leaves, no crackling of fire, just our anxious heartbeats resonate in the nothingness. He steals my breath and gives it back again. First I dare not to move, closing my eyes and allowing him to overpower me. My senses abandon me and I cling to him as the only certain thing in this suddenly dizzy world. The wolf gently lowers us onto the floor as he explores my mouth uncontested. His tongue wriggles and pushes at mine, trying to get me to engage. Before I know it, I'm kissing him back. As his paws roam freely across my body, brushing my chest, my groin, cupping my butt, our tongues join in a passionate dance. I can taste the burning ever clear. My breath speeds up, seeing how he towers above me. I feel his entire muscular form press against mine, and finally slides his right paw underneath the dress. I gasp in excitement, unable to believe this is really happening. The kiss breaks, but just for a moment so both of us can catch a breath. Our eyes meet, equal in his belief. He's trembling, clearly not expecting his eyes to take over so suddenly. I reach up to ruffle his cheek fluff and give him courage. I don't want him to back down or falter. The wolf leans into my open palm and exhale in anticipation. He's just as love-stricken as I am, his pupils gleaming with utter devotion. We're both lost in the mirrors of our souls, simply taking in the other for all they're worth. Feels like an eternity gazing into his lo- loveful eyes. Before I know it, the wolf quickly dives back towards me. He's kissing me deeper, harder. He's doing with an urgent need I never felt before. And I want it too. I want to sink into his fur, for him to squash me against the wooden floor, so I grab his shoulder and pull, let him know it's okay. He allows his weight to rest against me, and I gasp, his tongue still coiling deep inside my mouth. I can feel his throbbing erection press against mine. I feel out of breath, almost as if I ran a marathon. He groans softly, his low voice reverberating down into my throat. Once he issues a muffled growl of excitement, I'm already gone. I begin again and hastily doing my buckle. He aids me in pulling the dress off me. We throw each bit and piece carelessly around us as he picks me up into his arms and leads through the bedroom thresholds if I were a bride. He props me painfully onto the bed and I splay myself seductively. I watch him patiently, biting my lips as he undoes his pants and drops them hastily to the floor. The bed moans as he rushes onto it, again covering me entirely with his massive furry body. I look as he hovers above me, smiling in satisfaction like a hunter has finally cornered his prey. I reach out to his muzzle and pull him into another passionate kiss while my hands reach down to his loincloth. I undo the folds and let it fall freely, allowing the wolf to now press against me with his wolfhood. The slippery tip of his penis guides against my thigh like a sharpie, and I shudder, gasping for air and ecstasy, inviting him to dive inside my mouth with his tongue again. I'm not sure my body can take much more. I feel things I wasn't aware I'm capable of feeling. And so does he, judging by his now erect wolfhood. Although alien it all's a bit scary, it's also oh so exciting. I finally see him whole, just as a lunar made him, and I accept him as he is. I feel on fire. The only thing that could put out this lustful blaze is complete surrender to our joint desires. As I endure my own underwear, explaining myself completely exposed, the expression on the wolf suddenly shifts. As if he saw me the very first time and he's pulling away. What happened? Asking confusion, prop myself up my elbows. Uh, I can't. He rasped in a low, trembling voice. I can see his body shiver and not sure what actually went wrong. I mean, I can, but... If we do this, I can't promise I'll be able to control myself. 
He admits uncomfortably, laying his ears low and looking embarrassed to the side. What? I want to claim you. I desperately need to make you mine. And that's why I know I can lose myself in the process. Ulf exhales in a long, anxious breath, and I smile. Don't mind you getting a bit rough. You're a wolf, after all. I say, finding myself sounding slightly more excited at the prospect than appropriate. I place my hand on his paw, trying to give him some encouragement, but he closes his eyes. Well, seeing our size difference, I think we should take things slow. Okay. Real slow. Not like this. Not in the heat of the moment. I would forgive myself if I hurt you. He reiterates and I sigh, considerate to a fault. With my own emotions simmering down a bit, I can see his point. He's not wrong, no matter how frustrating this turned out to be. Seeing his exposed and erect wolfhood, I have to wonder how he'd even manage. I chuckle, shaking my head and giving him an awkward nude hug. He rubs his cheek against mine and plants a few soft licks here and there. Looking into his green eyes with love and understanding, simply kissed the tip of his slippery nose. This would go fast from Z to 100 and back to zero again. That's to be expected. Also, I don't want our first tie to be associated with... He pauses, looking away in shame. With what we talked about. Oh, of course. Damn, how bad would that be? I don't think either of us is in the right headspace. I try to laugh it off, but it's clear my emotions are still all over the place. But so are his, to be fair. He just came back from battle, confessed his worry about killing others. The house was just raided on top of that. Oh, fuck. I exhale in frustration. We really are two horny dummies. Well, at least I am. You show some restraint. Oh, I'm sorry. The wolf mumbles in an embarrassed tone. I quickly shake my head. Uh, no, don't be. In truth, I'm the one who's sorry. You didn't do anything I didn't wish for. I know. He nods, still very much defeated. That is why this is unfair on you. I'll take your unfairness any day over dozens of eager and inconsiderate wolves. I state, and he teasingly raises his brow at me. Wolves? Males. I roll my eyes, we both laugh. He leans his head into me and sighs in relief. Well, thank you for understanding. No prop, Bob. I wink and he chuckles again. Who's Bob? It's just a dumb expression. I shake my head and the wolf shares my amusement. He reaches my face, brushing my fringe away with his paw to then gently pet my cheek. You really mean the world to me, Moondrop. Keep calling me that. Is that meant to be my new pup name? I laugh teasingly. Well, that's just what you are to me. A drop of moonlight in my life. I smile at those words, completely taken aback. I don't want to hurt you, physically or otherwise. I know, it's fine. I lean to his paw and place a kiss on his middle bean. I wouldn't have it any other way. With our excitement subsiding, the torrent of thoughts calming down, I simply reach out to him and rub his cheek. Well, it's been a fucked up two weeks. He exhales, splaying himself on the bed. Yes, it has. I nod and lie down next to him. We stare at this for a few moments, his eyes closed and mine intent on watching him breathe. I really want to know he's fine, this didn't cause another shutdown. But it seems he's okay as his tail begins to pat the bed in beside him slowly. Set into a more comfortable position, pretty much certain we would go to sleep at this point. I would have the wolf tucking his muzzle under my chin. I kept his head with one hand while embracing him with the other. He snuggles deep into me, releasing soft whimpers, and I smile. It's all for such a strong creature to seek shelter in my frail arms, but I take great pride in it. Ranok needs comfort, and right now I'm the only one who can provide him that. It might be, not be the night I had hoped for, but it's still better than anything I would wish for. I gently kiss the top of his head and simply listening to his slow and more regular breath. I wake up extremely fresh and rested, almost as if coming out of a decade-long sleep. As I opened my eyes, I met with both unfamiliar and yet oddly recognisable scenery. It's a room, not the one in the forest, but an actual room of a modern-day youth. 
There's some random posters and hobby paraphernalia, figurines and even a corkboard with different cards and pictures. Immediately spot a PC at the desk, although the display is rather old and boxy. Even the window offers the view of a concrete jungle I thought I'd never see again. I struggle to pull the covers from me, eventually managed to slide my legs off the edge. Groggily with a lot of effort, I managed to sit up and give this place another look. What the fuck? I nearly jump up as the doors suddenly crack open, and a strange yet familiar woman enters the room. She looks like the typical 50s housewife. Oh, finally there you are! She rushes towards me with a wide smile. In panic, I slide off the bed, my legs still very much stiff and unresponsive. Oh, careful! The woman mutters and helps me up to my feet. She acts so familiar and up close that I keep staring at her intently, trying to conjure any memory of her. The doctor said your muscles will take some time to adjust. She continues when she sat me back on the bed. But none of that matters right now. Everyone will be so relieved. She claps her hands together and takes a joyful whirl in the middle of the room, causing her dress to spiral and unfurl like an umbrella. What? She's acting like a sitcom mom, sickeningly sweet and joyful. Granted, if I were out for a while, it would have been a somewhat natural reaction, but this... this feels off. I gaze around the room, noticing different wishing cards along with some balloons and garlands. It's even a welcome back Sam sign. What is all this? Do you like it? I was in charge of decorating. She seats herself next to me and pets my face in a motherly fashion. Each day I would sit here beside you thinking what to say when you finally woke up. Oh, how long was I out? Oh, it doesn't matter. She shakes her head, grasping at my hand. You're back here where you belong. Belong? Again, I make a careful scan of the room. That looks vaguely familiar. I don't feel I really belong here. Will you look at that? She suddenly scoffs and gets up, poking merrily at her wristwatch and making a silly face for emphasis. Your father is running late again. He probably be back in time for dinner, but you know him. She switches her hand dismissively and approaches the doors. Do I? I don't hide doubt in my tone. She stops, turning on the heel to give me another goofy expression. Oh, of course you do, Sam. What a silly thing to ask. For some reason her calling me that makes my stomach churn. Despite grimacing, she doesn't seem to mind. Anyway, I made your favourites. Pizza and an apple pie. So, two pies? I blink again, casting my gaze at my room in confusion. Come, get yourself changed and join me in the kitchen. She waves her hand invitingly and disappears into the adjacent room. I just sit there, stunned, looking at this new place I've found myself in. Where the fuck am I? <laughs>